the witness for the prosecution. Mr. Mahon adjusted his pince-nez and cleared his throat with a little dry-as-dust cough that was wholly typical of him. Then he looked again at the man opposite him, the man charged with willful murder. Mr. Mahon was a small man, precise in manner, neatly, not to say foppishly, dressed, with a pair of very shrewd and piercing grey eyes, by no means a fool. Indeed, as a solicitor, Mr. Mahon's reputation stood very high. His voice, when he spoke to his client, was dry, but not unsympathetic. I must impress upon you again that you are in very grave danger, and that the utmost frankness is necessary. Leonard Vole, who had been staring in a dazed fashion at the blank wall in front of him, transferred his glance to the solicitor. I know, he said hopelessly. You keep telling me so. But I can't seem to realize yet that I'm charged with murder. Murder. And such a dastardly crime, too. Mr. Mahon was practical, not emotional. He coughed again, took off his pince-nez, polished them carefully, and replaced them on his nose. Then he said, uh, Yes, yes, yes. Now, my dear Mr. Vole, we are going to make a determined effort to get you off, and uh, we shall succeed. We shall succeed. But I must have all the facts. I must know just how damaging the case against you is likely to be. Then we can fix upon the best line of defence. Still the young man looked at him in the same dazed, hopeless fashion. To Mr. Mahern, the case had seemed black enough, and the guilt of the prisoner assured. Now, for the first time, he felt a doubt. You think I'm guilty? said Leonard Vole in a low voice. But by God, I swear I'm not. It looks pretty black against me, I know that. I'm like a man caught in a net, the meshes of it all round me, entangling me whichever way I turn. But I didn't do it, Mr. Mahern, I did do it. In such a position, a man was bound to protest his innocence. Mr. Mayer knew that. Yet, in spite of himself, he was impressed. It might be, after all, that Leonard Vole was innocent. You are right, Mr. Vole, he said gravely. The case does look very black against you. Nevertheless, I accept your assurance. Now, let us get to facts. I want you to tell me in your own words exactly how you came to make the acquaintance of Miss Emily French. It was one day in Oxford Street. I saw an elderly lady crossing the road. She was carrying a lot of parcels. In the middle of the street she dropped them, tried to recover them, found the bus was almost on top of her, and just managed to reach the curb safely, dazed and bewildered by people having shouted at her. I recovered the parcels, wiped the mud off them as best I could, retied the string of one, and returned them to her. There was no question of your having saved her life. Oh, dear me, no. All I did was to perform a common act of courtesy. She was extremely grateful, thanked me warmly, and said something about my manners not being those of most of the younger generation. I can't remember the exact words. Then I lifted my hat and went on. I never expected to see her again. But life is full of coincidences. That very evening I came across her at a party at a friend's house. She recognized me at once and asked that I should be introduced to her. I then found out that she was a Miss Emily French and that she lived at Cricklewood. I talked to her for some time. She was, I imagine, an old lady who took sudden violent fancies to people. She took one to me on the strength of a perfectly simple action which anyone might have performed. On leaving, she shook me warmly by the hand and asked me to come and see her. I replied, of course, that I would be very pleased to do so, and she then urged me to name a day. I didn't want particularly to go, but it would have seemed churlish to refuse, so I fixed on the following Saturday. After she'd gone, I learned something about her from my friends, that she was rich, eccentric, lived alone with one maid, and owned no less than eight cats. I see, said Mr. Mayon. The question of her being well off came up as early as that? If you mean that I inquired, began Leonard Vole hotly, but Mr. Mahon stilled him with a gesture. I have to look at the case as it will be presented by the other side. An ordinary observer would not have supposed Miss French to be a lady of means. She lived poorly, almost humbly. Unless you had been told the contrary, you would in all probability have considered her to be in poor circumstances, at any rate, to begin with. Who was it, exactly, who told you that she was well off? 
my friend George Harvey, at whose house the party took place. Is he likely to remember having done so? I really don't know. Of course, it is some time ago now. Quite so, Mr. Vole. You see, the first aim of the prosecution will be to establish that you were in low water financially. That is true, is it not? Leonard Vole flushed. Yes, he said in a low voice. I'd been having a run of infernal bad luck just then. Quite so, said Mr. Mahern again. That being, as I say, in low water financially, you met this rich old lady and cultivated her acquaintance assiduously. Now, if we are in a position to say that you had no idea she was well off and that you visited her out of pure kindness of heart, which is the case, I dare say I am not disputing the point. I am looking at it from the outside point of view. A great deal depends on the memory of Mr. Harvey. Is he likely to remember that conversation, or is he not? Could he be confused by counsel into believing that it took place later? Leonard Vole reflected for some minutes, and then he said steadily enough, but with a rather paler face, I don't think that that line would be successful, Mr. Mahon. Several of those present heard his remark, and one or two of them chaffed me about my conquest of a rich old lady. The solicitor endeavoured to hide his disappointment with a wave of the hand. Unfortunately, he said, but I congratulate you upon your plain speaking, Mr. Vole. It is to you I look to guide me. Your judgment is quite right. To persist in the line I spoke of would have been disastrous. We must leave that point. You made the acquaintance of Miss French. You called upon her. The acquaintanceship progressed. We want a clear reason for all this. Why did you, a young man of thirty-three, good-looking, fond of sport, popular with your friends, devote so much time to an elderly woman with whom you could hardly have anything in common? Leonard Vole flung out his hands in a nervous gesture. I can't tell you. I, I really can't tell you. After the first visit, she pressed me to come again, spoke of being lonely and unhappy. She made it difficult for me to refuse. She showed so plainly her fondness and affection for me that I was placed in an awkward position. You see, Mr. Mahon, I've got a, a weak nature. I drift. I'm one of those people who can't say no. And believe me or not, as you like, after the third or fourth visit I paid her, I found myself getting genuinely fond of the old thing. My mother died when I was young. An aunt brought me up, and she too died before I was fifteen. If I told you that I genuinely enjoyed being mothered and pampered, I dare say you'd only laugh. Mr. Mahon did not laugh. Instead, he took off his pince again and polished them. Always a sign with him that he was thinking deeply. I accept your explanation, Mr. Vole, he said at last. I believe it to be psychologically probable. Whether a jury would take that view of it is another matter. Please continue your narrative. When was it that Miss French first asked you to look into her business affairs? After my third or fourth visit to her, she understood very little of money matters and was worried about some investments. Mr. Mayhern looked up sharply. Be careful, Mr. Vole. The maid, Janet Mackenzie, declares that her mistress was a good woman of business and transacted all her own affairs, and this is borne out by the testimony of her bankers. I can't help that, said Vole earnestly. That's what she said to me. Mr. Mayhard looked at him for a moment or two in silence. Though he had no intention of saying so, his belief in Leonard Vole's innocence was at that moment strengthened. He knew something of the mentality of elderly ladies. He saw Miss French, infatuated with the good-looking young man, hunting about for pretexts that should bring him to the house. What more likely than that she should plead ignorance of business and beg him to help her with her money affairs? She was enough of a woman of the world to realize that any man is slightly flattered by such an admission of his superiority. Leonard Vole had been flattered. Perhaps, too, she had not been averse to letting this young man know that she was wealthy. Emily French had been a strong-willed old woman, willing to pay her price for what she wanted. All this passed rapidly through Mr. Mahon's mind, but he gave no indication of it, and asked instead a further question. 
And you did handle her affairs for her at her request? I did. Mr. Vole, said the solicitor, I am going to ask you a very serious question, and one to which it is vital I should have a truthful answer. You were in low water financially. You had the handling of an old lady's affairs, an old lady who, according to her own statement, knew little or nothing of business. Did you at any time, or in any manner, convert to your own use the securities which you handled? Did you engage in any transaction for your own pecuniary advantage which will not bear the light of day? He quelled the other's response. Wait a minute before you answer. There are two courses open to us. Either we can make a feature of your probity and honesty in conducting her affairs whilst pointing out how unlikely it is that you would commit murder to obtain money which you might have obtained by such infinitely easier means. If, on the other hand, there is anything in your dealings which the prosecution will get hold of, if, to put it baldly, it can be proved that you swindled the old lady in any way, we must take the line that you had no motive for the murder since she was already a profitable source of income to you. You perceive the distinction. Now, I beg of you, take your time before you reply. But Leonard Vole took no time at all. My dealings with Miss French's affairs are all perfectly fair and above board. I acted for her interests to the very best of my ability, as anyone will find who looks into the matter. Thank you, said Mr. Mahon. You relieve my mind very much. I pay you the compliment of believing that you are far too clever to lie to me over such an important matter. Surely, said Vole eagerly, the strongest point in my favour is the lack of motive. Granted that I cultivated the acquaintanceship of a rich old lady in the hope of getting money out of her, that, I gather, is the substance of what you have been saying. Surely her death frustrates all my hopes. The solicitor looked at him steadily, then very deliberately he repeated his unconscious trick with his pince-nez. It was not until they were firmly replaced on his nose that he spoke. Are you not aware, Mr. Vole? Miss French left a will under which you are the principal beneficiary. What? The prisoner sprang to his feet. His dismay was obvious and unforced. My God, what are you saying? She left her money to me? Mr. Mayher nodded slowly. Vol sank down again, his head in his hands. You pretend you know nothing of this will? Pretend? There's no pretense about it. I knew nothing about it. What would you say if I told you that the maid, Janet Mackenzie, swears that you did know? that her mistress told her distinctly that she had consulted you in the matter and told you of her intentions. Say that she's lying. No, I, I go too fast. Janet is an elderly woman. She was a faithful watchdog to her mistress, and she didn't like me. She was jealous and suspicious. I should say that Miss French confided her intentions to Janet, and that Janet either mistook something she said or else was convinced in her own mind that I persuaded the old lady into doing it. I dare say that she believes herself now that Miss French actually told her so. You don't think that she dislikes you enough to lie deliberately about the matter? Leonard Vole looked shocked and startled. Oh, indeed, why should she? I don't know, said Mr. Mahern thoughtfully, but she's very bitter against you. The wretched young man groaned again. Oh, I, I'm beginning to see, he muttered. It's frightful. I made up to her. That's what they'll all say. I got her to make a will leaving her money to me, and then I go there that night and there's nobody in the house. They find her the next day. Oh, my God, it's awful. You are wrong about there being nobody in the house, said Mr. Mayon. Janet, as you remember, was to go out for the evening. She went, but about half-past nine she returned to fetch the pattern of a blouse sleeve which she had promised to a friend. She let herself in by the back door, went upstairs and fetched it, and went out again. 
She heard voices in the sitting room, though she could not distinguish what they said, but she will swear that one of them was Miss French's, and one was a man's. At half past nine, said Leonard Vole, at half past nine, he sprang to his feet. But then I'm saved. Saved! What do you mean, saved? cried Mr. Mahon, astonished. By half past nine I was at home again. My wife can prove that. I left Miss French about five minutes to nine. I arrived home about twenty past nine. My wife was there waiting for me. Oh, thank God, thank God, and bless Janet Mackenzie's sleeve pattern. In his exuberance he hardly noticed that the grave expression of the solicitor's face had not altered, but the latter's words brought him down to earth with a bump. Who then, in your opinion, murdered Miss French? Why, a, a burglar, of course, uh, as was thought at first. The window was forced, you remember? She was killed with a, with, with a heavy blow from a crowbar, and the crowbar was found lying on the floor beside the body, and several articles were missing. But for Janet's absurd suspicions and dislike of me, the police would never have swerved from the right track. That will hardly do, Mr. Vole, said the solicitor. The things that were missing were mere trifles of no value taken as a blind, and the marks on the window were not all conclusive. Besides, think for yourself. You say that you were no longer in the house by half-past nine. Who then was the man Janet heard talking to Miss French in the sitting room? She would hardly be having an amicable conversation with a burglar. No, said Vaux. No. He looked puzzled and discouraged. But anyway, he added with reviving spirit, it lets me out. I've got an alibi. You must see Romaine, my wife, at once. Certainly, acquiesced the lawyer. I should already have seen Mrs. Vole, but for her being absent when you were arrested. I wired to Scotland at once, and I understand that she arrives back tonight. I am going to call upon her immediately I leave here. Vole nodded, a great expression of satisfaction settling down over his face. Yes, Romaine will tell you. My God, it's a lucky chance, that. Excuse me, Mr. Vole, but you are very fond of your wife. Of course, and she of you. Romaine is devoted to me. She'd do anything in the world for me. He spoke enthusiastically, but the solicitor's heart sank a little lower. The testimony of a devoted wife, would it gain credence? Was there anyone else who saw you return at 9.20, a maid, for instance? We have no maid. Did you meet anyone in the street on the way back? Nobody I knew. I rode part of the way in a bus. A conductor, I remember. Mr. Mahern shook his head doubtfully. There is no one, then, who can confirm your wife's testimony. No, oh, but, but it isn't necessary, surely. I dare say not, I dare say not, said Mr. Mahon hastily. Now there is just one thing more. Did Miss French know that you were a married man? Oh, yes. Yet you never took your wife to see her. Why was that? For the first time, Leonard Vole's answer came halting and uncertain. Well... I don't know. Are you aware that Janet Mackenzie says her mistress believed you to be single and contemplated marrying you in the future? Bull laughed. <laughs> Absurd! There was forty years' difference in age between us. It has been done, said the solicitor dryly. The fact remains, your wife never met Miss French. No. Again the constraint. You will permit me to say, said the lawyer, that I hardly understand your attitude in the matter. Vole flushed, hesitated, and then spoke. I'll make a clean breast of it. I, I was hard up, as you know. I hoped that Miss French might lend me some money. She was fond of me, but she wasn't at all interested in the struggles of a young couple. Early on I found that she had taken it for granted that my wife and I didn't get on, were living apart. 
Mr. Mahan, I wanted the money for Romaine's sake. I said nothing and allowed the old lady to think what she chose. She spoke of my being an adopted son for her. There was never any question of marriage. That must be just Janet's imagination. And that is all? Yes, that is all. Was there just a shade of hesitation in the words? The lawyer fancied so. He rose and held out his hand. Goodbye, Mr. Vole. He looked into the haggard young face and spoke with an unusual impulse. I believe in your innocence in spite of the multitude of facts arrayed against you. I hope to prove it and vindicate you completely. Bowles smiled back at him. You find the alibis, all right, he said cheerfully. Again, he hardly noticed that the other did not respond. The whole thing hinges a good deal on the testimony of Janet Mackenzie, said Mr. Mahon. She hates you. That much is clear. She can hardly hate me, protested the young man. The solicitor shook his head as he went out. Now oh, for Mrs. Hole, he said to himself. He was seriously disturbed by the way the thing was shaping. The Voles lived in a small shabby house near Paddington Green. It was to this house that Mr. Mahern went. In answer to his ring, a big slatternly woman, obviously a charwoman, answered the door. Mrs. Vole, has she returned yet? Go back an hour ago, but I don't know if you can see her. If you will take my card to her, said Mr. Mahern quietly, I am quite sure that she will do so. The woman looked at him doubtfully, wiped her hand on her apron and took the card. Then she closed the door in his face and left him on the step outside. In a few minutes, however, she returned with a slightly altered manner. Come inside, please. She ushered him into a tiny drawing room. Mr. Mahern, examining a drawing on the wall, stared up suddenly to face a tall, pale woman who had entered so quietly that he had not heard her. Mr. Mahern, you are my husband's solicitor, are you not? You have come from him? Will you please sit down? Until she spoke, he had not realized that she was not English. Now observing her more closely, he noticed the high cheekbones, the dense blue-black of the hair, and an occasional very slight movement of the hands that was distinctly foreign, a strange woman, very quiet, so quiet as to make one uneasy. From the very first, Mr. Mahern was conscious that he was up against something that he did not understand. Now, my dear Mrs. Vole, he began, you must not give way. He stopped. It was so very obvious that Romaine Vole had not the slightest intention of giving way. She was perfectly calm and composed. Will you please tell me all about it, she said. I must know everything. Do not think to spare me. I want to know the worst. She hesitated, then repeated in a lower tone with a curious emphasis which the lawyer did not understand. I want to know the worst. Mr. Mahern went over his interview with Leonard Vole. She listened attentively, nodding her head now and then. I see, she said when he had finished. He wants me to say that he came in at twenty minutes past nine that night. He did come in at that time, said Mr. Mahern sharply. That is not the point, she said coldly. Will my saying so acquit him? Will they believe me? Mr. Mahon was taken aback. She'd gone so quickly to the core of the matter. That is what I want to know, she said. Will it be enough? Is there anyone else who can support my evidence? There was a suppressed eagerness in her manner that made him vaguely uneasy. So far there is no one else, he said reluctantly. I see said Romaine Vole. She sat for a minute or two perfectly still. A little smile played over her lips. The lawyer's feeling of alarm grew stronger and stronger. Mrs. Vole, he began, I know what you must feel. Uh, do you? she said. I wonder. 
In the circumstances, in the circumstances, I intend to play a lone hand. He looked at her in dismay. But my dear Mrs. Vole, you are overwrought, being so devoted to your husband. I beg your pardon? The sharpness of her voice made him start. He repeated in a hesitating manner, being so devoted to your husband. Romaine Vole nodded slowly, the same strange smile on her lips. Did he tell you that I was devoted to him? She asked softly. Ah, yes, I can see he did. How stupid men are. Stupid, stupid, stupid. She rose suddenly to her feet. All the intense emotion that the lawyer had been conscious of in the atmosphere was now concentrated in her tone. I hate him, I tell you. I hate him, I hate him, I hate him. I would like to see him hanged by the neck till he is dead. The lawyer recoiled before her and the smouldering passion in her eyes. She advanced a step nearer and continued vehemently, Perhaps I shall see it. Supposing I tell you that he did not come in that night at twenty past nine, but at twenty past ten. You say that he tells you he knew nothing about the money coming to him. Supposing I tell you he knew all about it, and counted on it, and committed murder to get it. Supposing I tell you that he admitted to me that night when he came in what he had done. That there was blood on his coat. What's then? Supposing that I stand up in court and say all these things. Her eyes seemed to challenge him with an effort. He concealed his growing dismay and endeavoured to speak in a rational tone. You cannot be asked to give evidence against your own husband. He is not my husband. Words came out so quickly that he fancied he'd misunderstood her. I beg your pardon. I... He is not my husband. The silence was so intense that you could have heard a pin drop. I was an actress in Vienna. My husband is alive, but in a madhouse so we could not marry. I'm glad now. She nodded defiantly. I should like you to tell me one thing, said Mr. Mahon. He contrived to appear as cool and unemotional as ever. Why are you so bitter against Leonard Vole? She shook her head, smiling a little. Yes, you would like to know, but I shall not tell you. I will keep my secret. Mr. Mahon gave his dry little cough and rose. There seems no point in prolonging this interview, he remarked. You will hear from me again after I have communicated with my client. She came closer to him, looking into his eyes with her own wonderful dark ones. Tell me, she said, did you believe, honestly, that he was innocent when you came here today? I did, said Mr. Mahon. You poor little man, she laughed. And I believe so still, finished the lawyer. Good evening, madam. He went out of the room, taking with him the memory of her startled face. This is going to be the devil of a business, said Mr. Mahon to himself as he strode along the street. Extraordinary, the whole thing. An extraordinary woman, a very dangerous woman. Women were the devil when they got their knife into you. What was to be done? That wretched young man hadn't a leg to stand upon, of course. Possibly he did commit the crime. No, said Mr. Mayhunt to himself. No, there's almost too much evidence against him. I don't believe this woman. She was trumping up the whole story. But she'll never bring it into court. He wished he felt more conviction on the point. The police court proceedings were brief and dramatic. The principal witnesses for the prosecution were Janet Mackenzie, maid to the dead woman, and Romaine Heilger, Austrian subject, the mistress of the prisoner. Mr. Mahern sat in the court and listened to the damning story that the latter told. It was on the lines she had indicated to him in their interview. 
The prisoner reserved his defence and was committed for trial. Mr. Mahern was at his wit's end. The case against Leonard Vole was black beyond words. Even the famous KC who was engaged with the defence held out little hope. If we can shake that Austrian woman's testimony, we might do something, he said dubiously. But it's a bad business. Mr. Mahern had concentrated his energies on one single point. Assuming Leonard Vole to be speaking the truth, and to have left the murdered woman's house at nine o'clock, who was the man whom Janet heard talking to Miss French at half-past nine? The only ray of light was in the shape of a scapegrace nephew who had in bygone days cajoled and threatened his aunt out of various sums of money. Janet Mackenzie, the solicitor learned, had always been attached to this young man, and had never ceased urging his claims upon her mistress. It certainly seemed possible that it was this nephew who had been with Miss French after Leonard Vole left, especially as he was not to be found in any of his old haunts. In all other directions, the lawyer's researches had been negative in their result. No one had seen Leonard Vole entering his own house or leaving that of Miss French. No one had seen any other man enter or leave the house in Cricklewood. All inquiries drew blank. It was the eve of the trial when Mr. Mahern received the letter, which was to lead his thoughts in an entirely new direction. It came by the six o'clock post, an illiterate scrawl, written on common paper and enclosed in a dirty envelope with the stamp stuck on crooked. Mr. Mahern read it through once or twice before he grasped its meaning. Dear Mr., you're the lawyer, chap, what acts, we young fella. If you want that painted foreign hussy showed up for what she is, and her back of lies, you come to Sixteen Shaw's Rents, Stepney, tonight. It'll cost you two hundred quid. Ask for Mrs. Bogson. The solicitor read and re-read this strange epistle. It might, of course, be a hoax, but when he thought it over, he became increasingly convinced that it was genuine, and also convinced that it was the one hope for the prisoner. The evidence of Romain Heilger damned him completely, and the line the defence meant to pursue, the line that the evidence of a woman who had admitted it lived an immoral life was not to be trusted, was at best a weak one. Mr. Mahern's mind was made up. It was his duty to save his client at all costs. He must go to Shaw's Rents. He had some difficulty in finding the place, a ramshackle building in an evil-smelling slum, but at last he did so, and on inquiry for Mrs. Mogson, was sent up to a room on the third floor. On this door he knocked, and getting no answer, knocked again. At this second knock he heard a shuffling sound inside, and presently the door was opened cautiously half an inch, and a bent figure peered out. Suddenly the woman, for it was a woman, gave a chuckle and opened the door wider. <laughs> so it's you, dearie, she said in a wheezy voice. Nobody with you, is there? No playing tricks? That's right. You can come in. You can come in. With some reluctance, the lawyer stepped across the threshold into the small dirty room with its flickering gas jet. There was an untidy, unmade bed in a corner, a plain deal table, and two rickety chairs. For the first time, Mr. Mahern had a full view of the tenant of this unsavoury apartment. She was a woman of middle age, bent in figure, with a mass of untidy grey hair, and a scarf wound tightly round her face. She saw him looking at this, and laughed again, the same curious, toneless chuckle. <laughs> Wondering why I hide my beauty, dear? <laughs> Afraid it may tempt you, eh? <laughs> but you shall see. You shall see. She drew aside the scarf, and the lawyer recoiled involuntarily before the almost formless blur of scarlet. She replaced the scarf again. So you're not wanting to kiss me, dearie? <laughs> I don't wonder. And yet I was a pretty girl once, not so long ago as you'd think either. 
Victuil, dearie, victuil, that's what did that. Ah, oh, but I'll be even with them. She burst into a hideous torrent of profanity which Mr. Mahern tried vainly to quell. She fell silent at last, her hands clenching and unclenching themselves nervously. Enough of that, said the lawyer sternly. I have come here because I have reason to believe that you can give me information which will clear my client, Leonard Vole. Is that the case? Her eye leered at him cunningly. What about the money, dearie? She wheezed. Two hundred quid, you remember? It is your duty to give evidence, and you can be called upon to do so. That won't do, dearie. I'm no woman, I know nothing, but you give me two hundred quid, and perhaps I can give you a hint or two, see? What kind of hint? What should you say to a letter? A letter from... Uh, never mind now, I got hold of it. That's my business. It'll do the trick, but I want my two hundred quid. Mr. Mahon looked at her coldly and made up his mind. I'll give you ten pounds, nothing more. And only that, if this letter is what you say it is. Ten pounds! She screamed and raved at him. Twenty, said Mr. Mahon, and that's my last word. He rose as if to go, then watching her closely, he drew out a pocketbook and counted out twenty one-pound notes. You see, he said, that is all I have with me. You can take it or leave it. But already he knew that the sight of the money was too much for her. She cursed and raved impotently, but at last she gave in. Going over to the bed, she drew something out from beneath the tattered mattress. Here you are, damn you, she snarled. It's a top one you want. End of side one. End of side one. End of side one. End of side one. Side two. It was a bundle of letters that she threw to him, and Mr. Mayhern untied them and scanned them in his usual cool, methodical manner. The woman watching him eagerly could gain no clue from his impassive face. He read each letter through, and then returned again to the top one and read it a second time. Then he tied the whole bundle up again carefully. They were love letters, written by Romaine Heilger, and the man they were written to was not Leonard Vole. The top letter was dated the day of the letter's arrest. I spoke too, dear, didn't I? whined the woman. It'll do for her, that letter. <laughs> Mr. Mahern put the letters in his pocket, and then he asked a question. How did you get hold of this correspondence? Ah, oh, that's telling, she said with a leer. But I have something more. I heard in court what that hussy said. Find out where she was at twenty past ten, the time she said she was at home. Ask up at the Lion Road Cinema, they remember. A fine, upstanding girl like that! Curse her! Who is the man? asked Mr. Mahon. There is only a Christian name here. The other's voice grew thick and hoarse. Her hands clenched and unclenched. Finally, she lifted one to her face. He's the man who did this to me! Many years ago now! She took him away from me, a chit of a girl she was then, and when I went after him, I went for him too. He threw the cursed stuff at me, and she laughed, damn her. I've had it in for her for years, followed her, I have spied upon her, and I got her. She'll suffer for this, won't she, Mr. Lawyer? She'll suffer. She will probably be sentenced to a term of imprisonment for perjury said Mr. Mahern quietly. Shut away! Shut away! That's what I want! You're going, are you? Where's my money? Where's that good money? 
Without a word, Mr. Mayhern put down the notes on the table, then, drawing a deep breath, he turned and left the squalid room. Looking back, he saw the old woman crooning over the money. He wasted no time. He found the cinema in Lyon Road easily enough, and shown a photograph of Romaine Heilger, the commissioner recognized her at once. She had arrived at the cinema with a man some time after ten o'clock on the evening in question. He had not noticed her escort particularly, but he remembered the lady who had spoken to him about the picture that was showing. They stayed until the end, about an hour later. Mr. Mayhern was satisfied. Romaine Heilger's evidence was a tissue of lies from beginning to end. She had evolved it out of her passionate hatred. The lawyer wondered whether he would ever know what lay behind that hatred. What had Leonard Bull done to her? He had seemed dumbfounded when the solicitor had reported her attitude to him. He had declared earnestly that such a thing was incredible. Yet it had seemed to Mr. Mayhern that after the first astonishment his protests had lacked sincerity. He did know. Mr. Mayhern was convinced of it. He knew, but had no intention of revealing the fact. The secret between those two remained a secret. Mr. Mayhern wondered if some day he should come to learn what it was. The solicitor glanced at his watch. It was late, but time was everything. He hailed a taxi and gave an address. Sir Charles must know of this at once, he murmured to himself as he got in. The trial of Leonard Vole for the murder of Emily French aroused widespread interest. In the first place, the prisoner was young and good-looking. Then he was accused of a particularly dastardly crime and there was the further interest of Romaine Heilger, the principal witness for the prosecution. There had been pictures of her in many papers, and several fictitious stories as to her origin and history. The proceedings opened quietly enough. Various technical evidence came first. Then Janet Mackenzie was called. She told substantially the same story as before. In cross-examination, counsel for the defence succeeded in getting her to contradict herself once or twice over her account of Vole's association with Miss French. He emphasised the fact that though she had heard a man's voice in the sitting room that night, there was nothing to show that it was Vole who was there, and he managed to drive home a feeling that jealousy and dislike of the prisoner were at the bottom of a good deal of her evidence. Then the next witness was called. Your name is Romaine Halga. Yes. You are an Austrian subject? Yes. For the last three years you have lived with the prisoner and passed yourself off as his wife. Just for a moment, Romaine Halga's eye met those of the man in the dock. Her expression held something curious and unfathomable. Yes. The questions went on. Word by word, the damning facts came out. On the night in question, the prisoner had taken out a crowbar with him. He had returned at twenty minutes past ten and had confessed to having killed the old lady. His cuffs had been stained with blood and he had burned them in the kitchen stove. He had terrorized her into silence by means of threats. As the story proceeded, the feeling of the court, which had, to begin with, been slightly favourable to the prisoner, now set dead against him. He himself sat with downcast head and moody air, as though he knew he were doomed. Yet it might have been noted that her own counsel sought to restrain Romaine's animosity. He would have preferred her to be a more unbiased witness. Formidable and ponderous, counsel for the defence arose. He put it to her that her story was a malicious fabrication from start to finish, and that she had not even been in her own house at the time in question, that she was in love with another man, and was deliberately seeking to send Vol to his death for a crime he did not commit. Romaine denied these allegations with superb insolence. Then came the surprising denouement, the production of the letter. It was read aloud in court in the midst of a breathless stillness. Max, beloved, the fates have delivered him into our hands. 
He has been arrested for murder. But yes, the murder of an old lady, Leonard, who would not hurt a fly. At last I shall have my revenge. The poor chicken. I shall say that he came in that night with blood upon him, that he confessed to me. I shall hang him, Max. And when he hangs, he will know and realize that it was Romaine who sent him to his death. And then, happiness, beloved, happiness at last. There were experts present ready to swear that the handwriting was that of Romaine Heilger, but they were not needed. Confronted with the letter, Romaine broke down utterly and confessed everything. Leonard Vole had returned to the house at the time, he said, twenty past nine. She had invented the whole story to ruin him. With the collapse of Romain Heilger, the case for the Crown collapsed also. Sir Charles called his few witnesses. The prisoner himself went into the box and told his story in a manly, straightforward manner, unshaken by cross-examination. The prosecution endeavoured to rally, but without great success. The judge's summing up was not wholly favourable to the prisoner, but a reaction had set in, and the jury needed little time to consider their verdict. We find the prisoner not guilty. Leonard Vole was free. Little Mr. Mayhern hurried from his seat. He must congratulate his client. He found himself polishing his pince vigorously and checked himself. His wife had told him only the night before that he was getting a habit of it. Curious things, habits. People themselves never knew they had them. An interesting case, a very interesting case. That woman now, Romaine Heilger. The case was dominated for him still by the exotic figure of Romaine Heilger. She had seemed a pale, quiet woman in the house at Paddington, but in court she had flamed out against the sober background. She had flaunted herself like a tropical flower. If he closed his eyes, he could see her now, tall and vehement, her exquisite body bent forward a little, her right hand clenching and unclenching itself unconsciously all the time. Curious things, habits. That gesture of hers with the hand was her habit, he supposed. Yet he'd seen someone else do it quite lately. Who was it now? Quite lately. He drew in his breath with a gasp as it came back to him. The woman in Shaw's rents. He stood still, his head whirling. It was impossible, impossible. And yet, Romaine Heilger was an actress. The KC came up behind him and clapped him on the shoulder. Congratulated our man yet? He's had a narrow shave, you know. Come along and see him. But the little lawyer shook off the other's hand. He wanted one thing only, to see Romaine Heilger face to face. He did not see her until some time later, and the place of their meeting is not relevant. So you guessed, she said, when he had told her all that was in his mind. The face, oh, that was easy enough, and the light of that gas jet was too bad for you to see the makeup. But why... Why? Why did I play a lone hand? She smiled a little, remembering the last time she had used the words. Such an elaborate comedy. My friend, I had to save him. The evidence of a woman devoted to him would not have been enough. You hinted as much yourself. But I know something of the psychology of crowds. Let my evidence be wrung from me as an admission, damning me in the eyes of the law, and a reaction in favor of the prisoner would immediately set in. And the bundle of letters, one alone, the vital one, might have seemed like a, a what do you call it, a put-up job. Then the man called Max never existed, my friend. I still think, said little Mr. Mayhern in an aggrieved manner, that we could have got him off by the um, uh, normal procedure. I dared not risk it. You see, 
You thought he was innocent. Ah, and you knew it. I see, said little Mr. Mayhern. My dear Mr. Mayhern, said Romaine, you do not see at all. I knew he was guilty. The Mystery of the Blue Jar Jack Hartington surveyed his topped drive ruefully. Standing by the ball, he looked back to the tee, measuring the distance. His face was eloquent of the disgusted contempt which he felt. With a sigh, he drew out his iron, executed two vicious swings with it, annihilating in turn a dandelion and a tuft of grass, and then addressed himself firmly to the ball. It's hard when you're twenty-four years of age, and your one ambition in life is to reduce your handicap at golf, to be forced to give time and attention to the problem of earning your living. Five and a half days out of the seven saw Jack imprisoned in a kind of mahogany tomb in the city. Saturday afternoon and Sunday were religiously devoted to the real business of life, and in an excess of zeal he had taken rooms at the small hotel near Stoughton Heath Links, and rose daily at the hour of 6 a.m. to get in an hour's practice before catching the 8.46 to town. The only disadvantage to the plan was that he seemed constitutionally unable to hit anything at that hour in the morning. A foozled iron succeeded a muffed drive. His mashy shots ran merrily along the ground, and four putts seemed to be the minimum on any green. Jack sighed grasped his iron firmly and repeated to himself the magic words, Left arm right through and don't look up. He swung back and then stopped, petrified, as a shrill cry rent the silence of the summer's morning. Murder! It called, Help! Murder! <sighs> it was a woman's voice, and it died away at the end into a sort of a gurgling sigh. Jack flung down his club and ran in the direction of the sound. It had come from somewhere quite near at hand. This particular part of the course was quite wild country, and there were few houses about. In fact, there was only one near at hand, a small picturesque cottage, which Jack had often noticed for its air of old-world daintiness. It was towards this cottage that he ran. It was hidden from him by a heather-covered slope, but he rounded this, and in less than a minute was standing with his hand on the small latched gate. There was a girl standing in the garden, and for a moment Jack jumped to the natural conclusion that it was she who had uttered the cry for help, but he quickly changed his mind. She had a little basket in her hand, half full of weeds, and had evidently just straightened herself up from weeding a wide border of pansies. Her eyes, Jack noticed, were just like pansies themselves, velvety and soft and dark and more violet than blue. She was like a pansy altogether in her straight purple linen gown. The girl was looking at Jack with an expression midway between annoyance and surprise. I beg your pardon, said the young man, but did you cry out just now? I? No, indeed. Her surprise was so genuine that Jack felt confused. Her voice was very soft and pretty, with a slight foreign inflection. But you must have heard it, he exclaimed. It came from somewhere just near here. She stared at him. I heard nothing at all. Jack, in his turn, stared at her. It was perfectly incredible that she should not have heard that agonized appeal for help. And yet her calmness was so evident that he could not believe she was lying to him. It came from somewhere close at hand, he insisted. She was looking at him suspiciously now. What did it say? she asked. Murder! Help! Murder! Murder, help, murder, repeated the girl. Somebody has played a trick on you, monsieur. Who could be murdered here? Jack looked about him with a confused idea of discovering a dead body upon a garden path, yet he was still perfectly sure that the cry he had heard was real and not a product of his imagination. He looked up at the cottage windows. Everything seemed perfectly still and peaceful. Do you want to search our house? asked the girl dryly. She was so clearly sceptical that Jack's confusion grew deeper than ever. He turned away. I'm sorry, he said. 
It must have come from higher up in the woods. He raised his cap and retreated. Glancing back over his shoulder, he saw that the girl had calmly resumed her weeding. For some time he hunted through the woods, but could find no sign of anything unusual having occurred. Yet he was as positive as ever that he had really heard the cry. In the end he gave up the search and hurried home to bolt his breakfast and catch the 846 by the usual narrow margin of a second or so. His conscience pricked him a little as he sat in the train. Ought he not to have immediately reported what he had heard to the police? That he had not done so was solely owing to the pansy girl's incredulity. She had clearly suspected him of romancing. Possibly the police might do the same. Was he absolutely certain that he had heard the cry? By now he was not nearly so positive as he had been. The natural result of trying to recapture a lost sensation... Was it some bird's cry in the distance that he had twisted into the semblance of a woman's voice? But he rejected the suggestion angrily. It was a woman's voice, and he had heard it. He remembered looking at his watch just before the cry had come. As nearly as possible, it must have been five and twenty minutes past seven when he had heard the call. That might be a fact useful to the police, if, if anything should be discovered. Going home that evening, he scanned the evening papers anxiously to see if there were any mention of a crime having been committed, but there was nothing, and he hardly knew whether to be relieved or disappointed. The following morning was wet, so wet that even the most ardent golfer might have his enthusiasm damped. Jack rose at the last possible moment, gulped his breakfast, ran for the train, and again eagerly scanned the papers, still no mention of any gruesome discovery having been made evening papers told the same tale. Queer, said Jack to himself. Ah, but there it is. Probably some blinking little boys having a game together up in the woods. He was out early the following morning, and as he passed the cottage he noted out of the tail of his eye that the girl was out in the garden again, weeding, evidently a habit of hers. He did a particularly good approach shot and hoped that she had noticed it. As he teed up on the next tee... He glanced at his watch. Just five and twenty past seven, he murmured. I wonder... The words were frozen on his lips. From behind him came the same cry which had so startled him before. A woman's voice in dire distress. Murder! Help! Murder! Jack raced back. The pansy girl was standing by the gate. She looked startled, and Jack ran up to her triumphantly, crying out, You heard it this time, anyway! Her eyes were wide with some emotion he could not fathom, but he noticed that she shrank back from him as he approached, and even glanced back at the house, as though she meditated running to it for shelter. She shook her head, staring at him. I heard nothing at all, she said wonderingly. It was as though she had struck him a blow between the eyes. Her sincerity was so evident that he could not disbelieve her, yet he couldn't have imagined it. He couldn't, he couldn't. He heard her voice speaking gently, almost with sympathy. You have had the shell shock, yes? In a flash he understood her look of fear, her glance back at the house. She thought that he suffered from delusions. Then, like a douche of cold water, came the horrible thought, was she right? Did he suffer from delusions? Obsessed by the horror of the thought, he turned and stumbled away without vouchsafing a word. The girl watched him go, sighed, shook her head, and bent down to her weeding again. Jack endeavoured to reason matters out with himself. If I hear the damn thing again at twenty-five minutes past seven, he said to himself, it's clear that I've got hold of a hallucination of some sort. But I won't hear it. He was nervous all that day, and went to bed early, determined to put the matter to the proof the following morning. As was perhaps natural in such a case, he remained awake half the night and finally overslept himself. It was twenty past seven by the time he was clear of the hotel and running towards the links. He realized that he would not be able to get to the fatal spot by twenty-five past, but surely if the voice was a hallucination pure and simple, he would hear it anywhere. He ran on his eyes fixed on the hands of his watch. Twenty-five past. From far off came the echo of a woman's voice calling. The 
words could not be distinguished, but he was convinced that it was the same cry he had heard before, and that it came from the same spot somewhere in the neighbourhood of the cottage. Strangely enough, that fact reassured him it might, after all, be a hoax. Unlikely as it seemed, the girl herself might be playing a trick on him. He set his shoulders resolutely and took out a club from his golf bag. He would play the few holes up to the cottage. The girl was in the garden, as usual. She looked up this morning, and when he raised his cap to her, said good morning, rather shyly. She looked, he thought, lovelier than ever. Nice day, isn't it? Jack called out cheerily, cursing the unavoidable banality of the observation. Yes, indeed, it is lovely. Good for the garden, I expect. The girl smiled a little, disclosing a fascinating dimple. Alas, no. For my flowers, the rain is needed. See, they are all dried up. Jack accepted the invitation of her gesture and came up to the low hedge dividing the garden from the course, looking over it into the garden. They seem all right, he remarked awkwardly, conscious as he spoke of the girl's slightly pitying glance running over him. The sun is good, is it not? she said. For the flowers one can always water them, but the sun gives strength and repairs the health. Monsieur is much better today, I can see. Her encouraging tone annoyed Jack intensely. Curse it all, he said to himself. I believe she's trying to cure me by suggestion. I'm perfectly well, he said. That is good, then, returned the girl quickly and soothingly. Jack had the irritating feeling that she didn't believe him. He played a few more holes and hurried back to breakfast. As he ate it, he was conscious, not for the first time, of the close scrutiny of a man who sat at the table next to him. He was a man of middle age, with a powerful, forceful face. He had a small, dark beard and very piercing grey eyes, and an ease and assurance of manner which placed him among the higher ranks of the professional classes. His name, Jack knew, was Lavington, and he had heard vague rumours as to his being a well-known medical specialist. But, as Jack was not a frequenter of Harley Street, the name had conveyed little or nothing to him. But this morning he was very conscious of the quiet observation under which he was being kept, and it frightened him a little. Was his secret written plainly in his face for all to see? Did this man, by reason of his professional calling, know that there was something amiss in the hidden grey matter? Jack shivered at the thought. Was it true? Was he really going mad? Was the whole thing a hallucination? Or was it a gigantic hoax? And suddenly, a very simple way of testing the solution occurred to him. He had hitherto been alone on his round, supposing someone else was with him. Then one out of three things might happen. The voice might be silent, they might both hear it, or he only might hear it. That evening he proceeded to carry his plan into effect. Lavington was the man he wanted with him. They fell into conversation easily enough. The older man might have been waiting for such an opening. It was clear that for some reason or other Jack interested him. The latter was able to come quite easily and naturally to the suggestion that they might play a few holes together before breakfast. The arrangement was made for the following morning. They started out a little before seven. It was a perfect day, still and cloudless, but not too warm. The doctor was playing well, Jack wretchedly. His whole mind was intent on the forthcoming crisis. He kept glancing surreptitiously at his watch. They reached the seventh tee, between which and the hole the cottage was situated. About twenty past seven. The girl, as usual, was in the garden as they passed. She did not look up. Two balls lay on the green, Jack's near the hole, the doctor's some little distance away. I've got this for it, said Lavington. I must go for it, I suppose. He bent down, judging the line he should take. Jack stood rigid, his eyes glued to his watch. It was exactly twenty-five minutes past seven. The ball ran swiftly along the grass, stopped on the edge of the hole, hesitated, and dropped in. Good part, said Jack. 
His voice sounded hoarse and unlike himself. He shoved his wristwatch farther up his arm with a sigh of overwhelming relief. Nothing had happened. The spell was broken. If you don't mind waiting a minute, he said, I think I'll have a pipe. They paused a while on the eighth tea. Jack filled and lit the pipe with fingers that trembled a little in spite of himself. An enormous weight seemed to have lifted from his mind. Lord, what a good day it is, he remarked, staring at the prospect ahead of him with great contentment. Go on, Lavington, your swipe. And then it came. Just at the very instant the doctor was hitting, a woman's voice, high and agonized, Murder! Help! Murder! The pipe fell from Jack's nerveless hand as he spun round in the direction of the sound, and then, remembering, gazed breathlessly at his companion. Lavington was looking down the course, shading his eyes. A bit short. Just cleared the bunker, though, I think. He had heard nothing. The world seemed to spin round with Jack. He took a step or two, lurching heavily. When he recovered himself, he was lying on the short turf, and Lavington was bending over him. Uh, take it easy now, now. Take it easy. What did I do? You fainted, young man. You gave a very good try at it. My God, said Jack, and groaned. What's the trouble? Something on your mind? I'll tell you in one minute, but I'd like to ask you something first. The doctor lit his own pipe and settled himself on the bank. Ask anything you like, he said comfortably. You've been watching me for the last day or two? Why? Lamington's eyes twinkled a little. That's a rather an awkward question. <laughs> a cat can look at a king, you know. Don't put me off. I'm earnest. Why was it? I've a vital reason for asking. Lavington's face grew serious. I'll answer you quite honestly. I recognized in you all the signs of a man laboring under a sense of acute strain, and it intrigued me what that strain could be. Well, I can tell you that easily enough, said Jack bitterly. I'm going mad. He stopped dramatically, but his statement not seeming to arouse the interest and consternation he expected, he repeated it. I tell you, I'm going mad. Very curious murmured Lavington. Very curious indeed. Jack felt indignant. I suppose that's all it does seem to you. Doctors are so damned callous. Come, come, my young friend, you're talking at random. To begin with, although I've taken my degree, I do not practice medicine. Strictly speaking, I'm not a doctor. Not a doctor of the body, that is. Jack looked at him keenly. Or the mind? Yes, in a sense. But more truly, I call myself... A doctor of the soul. Oh. I perceive the disparagement in your tone, and yet we must use some word to denote the active principle which can be separated and exist independently of its fleshy home, the body. You've got to come to terms with the soul, you know, young man. It isn't just a religious term invented by clergymen. But we'll call it the mind or the subconscious self or any term that suits you better. You took offence at my tone just now, but I can assure you that it really did strike me as very curious that such a well-balanced and perfectly normal young man as yourself should suffer from the delusion that he was going out of his mind. I'm out of my mind, all right. Absolutely balmy. Oh, forgive me for saying so, but I don't believe it. I suffer from delusions. After dinner? No, in the morning. Can't be done, said the doctor, relighting his pipe, which had gone out. I tell you, I hear things that no one else hears. One man in a thousand can see the moons of Jupiter, because the other 999 can't see them. There's no reason to doubt that the moons of Jupiter exist, and certainly no reason for calling the thousandth man a lunatic. The moons of Jupiter are a proved scientific fact. Well, it's quite possible that the delusions of today may be the proved scientific facts of tomorrow. In spite of himself, Lavington's matter-of-fact manner was having its effect upon Jack. He felt immeasurably soothed and cheered. The doctor looked at him attentively for a minute or two and then nodded. That's better, he said. 
The trouble with you young fellows is that you're so cocksure nothing can exist outside your own philosophy that you get the wind up when something occurs to jolt you out of that opinion. Let's hear your grounds for believing that you're going mad, and we'll decide whether or not to lock you up afterwards. As faithfully as he could, Jack narrated the whole series of occurrences. But what I can't understand, he ended, is why this morning it should come at half past seven, five minutes late. Lavington thought for a minute or two, then, What's the time by your watch now? he asked. Quarter to eight, replied Jack consulting it. That's simple enough, then. <laughs> Mine says twenty to eight. Your watch is five minutes fast. That's a very interesting and important point to me. In fact, it's invaluable. In what way? Jack was beginning to get interested. Well, the obvious explanation is that on the first morning you did hear some such cry. It may have been a joke, may not. On the following mornings you suggested yourself to hear it at exactly the same time. I'm sure I didn't. Well, not consciously, of course, but the, the subconscious plays us some funny tricks, you know. But anyway, that explanation won't wash. If it was a case of suggestion, you would have heard the cry twenty-five minutes past seven by your watch, and you could never have heard it when the time, as you thought, was past. Well, then? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? This cry for help occupies a perfectly definite place and time in space. Place is the vicinity of that cottage... And the time is twenty-five minutes past seven. Yes, but why should I be the one to hear it? I don't believe in ghosts and all that spook stuff, spirits rapping and all the rest of it. Why should I hear the damn thing? Ah, uh, uh, that we can't tell at present. It's a curious thing that many of the best mediums are made out of confirmed sceptics. It isn't the people who are interested in the cult phenomena who get the manifestations. Some people see and hear things that other people don't. We don't know why, and nine times out of ten they don't want to see or hear them. And they're convinced that they're suffering from delusions, just as you were. It's like electricity. Some substances are good conductors, others are non-conductors, and for a long time we didn't know why, and had to be content just to accept the fact. Nowadays, we do know why. Someday, no doubt, we shall know why you hear this thing, and I and the girl don't. Everything is governed by natural law, you know. There's no such thing, really, as the supernatural. Finding out the laws that govern the so-called psychic phenomena is going to be a tough job, but every little helps. But what am I going to do? asked Jack. Lavington chuckled. <laughs> well, practical, I see. Well, my young friend, you're going to have a good breakfast and get off to the city without worrying your head further about things you don't understand. I, on the other hand, am going to poke about and see what I can find out about that cottage back there. That's where the mystery centers, I dare swear. Jack rose to his feet. Right, sir, I'm on, but I say... Yes? Jack flushed awkwardly. I'm sure the girl's all right, he muttered. Lavington looked amused. You didn't tell me she was a pretty girl. Well, uh, cheer up. I think the mystery started before her time. End of side two. End of side two. End of side two. End of side two. Side three. Jack arrived home that evening in a perfect fever of curiosity. He was by now pinning his faith blindly to Lavington. The doctor had accepted the matter so naturally, it had been so matter-of-fact and unperturbed by it, that Jack was impressed. He found his new friend waiting for him in the hall when he came down for dinner, and the doctor suggested that they should dine together at the same table. "'Any news, sir?' asked Jack anxiously. "'Why, well, I've collected the life history of Heather Cottage, all right. It was tenanted first by an old gardener and his wife. The old man died, and the old woman went to her daughter.' Then a builder got hold of it and modernized it with great success, selling it to a city gentleman who used it for weekends. But a year ago, he sold it to some people called Turner, Mr. and Mrs. Turner. They seem to have been a rather curious couple, from all I can make out. He was an Englishman, his wife was popularly supposed to be partly Russian, and was a very handsome, exotic-looking woman. 
They lived very quietly, seeing no one, and hardly ever going outside the cottage garden. The local rumour goes that they were afraid of something, but I don't think we ought to rely on that. And then suddenly, one day, they departed and cleared out one morning early and never came back. The agent here got a letter from Mr. Turner, written from London, instructing him to sell up the place as quickly as possible. The furniture was sold off, and the house itself was sold to a Mr. Moore Labourer. He only actually lived in it a fortnight, then he advertised it to be let, furnished. The people who have it now are a consumptive French professor and his daughter. They've been there just ten days. Jack digested this in silence. I don't see that that gets us any forrada, he said at last. Do you? I rather want to know more about the Turners, said Abington quietly. They left very early in the morning, you remember. As far as I can make out, nobody actually saw them go. Mr. Turner has been seen since, but I can't find anybody who has seen Mrs. Turner. Jack hailed. It can't be. You don't mean... Don't excite yourself, young man. The influence of anyone at the point of death, and especially of violent death, upon their surroundings is very strong. Those surroundings might conceivably absorb that influence, transmitting it in turn to a suitably tuned receiver, in this case, yourself. Why me? murmured Jack rebelliously. Why not someone who could do some good? Uh, you're regarding the force as intelligent and purposeful instead of blind and mechanical. I do not believe myself in earthbound spirits haunting a spot for one particular purpose, but the thing I have seen again and again, until I can hardly believe it to be pure coincidence, is a kind of blind groping towards justice, a subterranean moving of blind forces always working obscurely towards that end. He shook himself as though casting off some obsession that preoccupied him and turned to Jack with a ready smile. Let us banish the subject for the night at all events, he suggested. Jack agreed readily enough, but didn't find it so easy to banish the subject from his own mind. During the weekend he made vigorous inquiries of his own, but succeeded in eliciting little more than the doctor had done. He had definitely given up playing golf before breakfast. The next link in the chain came from an unexpected quarter. On getting back one day, Jack was informed that a young lady was waiting to see him. To his intense surprise, it proved to be the girl of the garden, a pansy girl, as he always called her in his own mind. She was very nervous and confused. You will forgive me, monsieur, for coming to seek you like this, but there is something, there is something I want to tell you. I... And she looked around uncertainly. Oh, come in here, said Jack promptly leading the way into the now deserted ladies' drawing room of the hotel, a dreary apartment with a good deal of red plush about it. Now sit down, Miss... Um, Miss... Uh, Marchot, Monsieur. Feliz Marchot. Sit down, Mademoiselle Marchot, and tell me all about it. Felice sat down obediently. She was dressed in dark green today, and the beauty and the charm of the proud little face was more evident than ever. Jack's heart beat faster as he sat down beside her. "'It's like this,' explained Felice. "'We have been here but a short time, "'and from the beginning we hear the house, "'our so sweet little house, is haunted. "'No servant will stay in it. "'That does not matter so much. "'Me, I can do the menage and cook easily enough.' "'Angel,' thought the infatuated young man, "'she's wonderful.' but he maintained an outward semblance of business-like attention. This talk of ghosts, I think it is all folly, that is, until four days ago. Monsieur, four nights running, I have had the same dream. A lady stands there, she's beautiful, tall, and very fair. In her hands she holds a blue china jar. She is distressed, very distressed, and continually she holds out the jar to me, as though imploring me to do something with it. But alas, she cannot speak, and I, I do not know what she asks. That was a dream for the first two nights, but the night before last there was more of it. She and the blue jar faded away, and suddenly I heard her voice crying out. I know it is her voice, you comprehend, and oh, monsieur, the words, as she says, are those you spoke to me that morning, 
Murder! Help! Murder! I walk in terror. I say to myself, it is a nightmare. The words you heard are an accident. But last night, the dream came again. Monsieur, what is it? You too have heard. What shall we do? Lise's face was terrified. Her small hands clasped themselves together, and she gazed appealingly at Jack. The latter affected an unconcern he did not feel. Oh, that's all right, Mademoiselle Marchot. You mustn't worry. I tell you what I'd like you to do, if you don't mind. Repeat the whole story to a friend of mine who is staying here, a Dr. Lavington. Elise signified her willingness to adopt this course, and Jack went off in search of Lavington. He returned with him a few minutes later. Lavington gave the girl a keen scrutiny as he acknowledged Jack's hurried introductions. With a few reassuring words, he soon put the girl at her ease, and he, in his turn, listened attentively to her story. Very curious, he said when she'd finished. You tell your father of this. Elise shook her head. I have not liked to worry him. He is very ill still. Her eyes filled with tears. I keep from him anything that might excite or agitate him. I understand, said Levington kindly. I'm glad you came to us, Mademoiselle Marshall. Hartington here, as you know, had experienced something similar to yours. I think I may say that we are well on the track now. Uh, there is nothing else that you can think of. Belize gave a quick movement. Of course! How stupid I am! It is the point of the whole story. Look, monsieur, at what I found at the back of one of the cupboards where it had slipped behind the shelf. She held out to them a dirty piece of drawing paper on which was executed roughly in watercolors a sketch of a woman. It was a mere daub, but the likeness was probably good enough. It represented a tall, fair woman with something subtly un-English about her face. She was standing by a table on which was standing a blue china jar. I only found it this morning, explained Felice. Monsieur Doctor, that is the face of the woman I saw in my dream, and that is the identical blue jar. Extraordinary, commented Lavington. The key to the mystery is evidently the blue jar. Looks like a Chinese jar to me, probably an old one. Seems to have a curious raised pattern over it. It is Chinese, declared Jack. I've seen an exactly similar one in my uncle's collection. He's a great collector of Chinese porcelain, you know, and I remember noticing a jar just like that a short time ago. The Chinese jar, mused Levington. He remained a minute or two lost in thought, and then raised his head suddenly, a curious light shining in his eyes. Hartington, how long has your uncle had that jar? How long? I really don't know. Think. Did he buy it lately? I don't know. Oh, yes, I believe he did, now I come to think of it. I'm not very interested in porcelain myself, but I remember his showing me his recent acquisitions, and this was one of them. Less than two months ago. The Turners left Heather Cottage just two months ago. Oh, yes, I believe it was. Your uncle attends country sales sometimes. Oh, he's always tooling around to sales. Then there's no inherent improbability in our assuming that he bought this particular piece of porcelain at the sale of the Turner's things. A curious coincidence. Or perhaps what I call the groping of blind justice. Hardington, you must find out from your uncle at once where he bought this jar. Jack's face fell. I'm afraid that's impossible. Uncle George is away on the continent. I don't even know where to write to him. How long will he be away? Ooh, three weeks to a month at least. There was a silence. Felice sat looking anxiously from one man to the other. Is there nothing that we can do? She asked timidly. Oh, yes, there is one thing, said Lavington in a tone of suppressed excitement. It's unusual, perhaps, but I believe that it will succeed. Hartington, you must get hold of that jar. Bring it down here. And if Mademoiselle permits, we will spend a night at Heather Cottage taking the blue jar with us. Jack felt his skin creep uncomfortably. What do you think will happen? He asked uneasily. I haven't the slightest idea. But I honestly believe that the mystery will be solved and the ghost laid. Quite possibly... Uh, there may be a false bottom to the jar, and something is concealed inside it. If no phenomenon occurs, we must use our own ingenuity. Elise clasped her hands. 
It is a wonderful idea, she exclaimed. Her eyes were alight with enthusiasm. Jack did not feel nearly so enthusiastic. In fact, he was inwardly funking it badly, but nothing would have induced him to admit the fact before Felice. The doctor acted as though his suggestion were the most natural one in the world. When can you get to Dar? asked Felice, turning to Jack. Tomorrow, said the latter unwillingly. He had to go through with it now, but the memory of the frenzied cry for help that had haunted him each morning was something to be ruthlessly thrust down and not thought about more than could be helped. He went to his uncle's house the following evening and took away the jar in question. He was more than ever convinced when he saw it again that it was the identical one pictured in the watercolour sketch, but carefully as he looked it over he could see no sign that it contained a secret receptacle of any kind. It was eleven o'clock when he and Lavington arrived at Heather Cottage. Felice was on the lookout for them and opened the door softly before they had time to knock. Come in, she whispered. My father is asleep upstairs and we must not wake him. I have made coffee for you in here. She led the way into a small, cosy sitting room. A spirit lamp stood in the grate and bending over it she brewed them both some fragrant coffee. Then Jack unfastened the Chinese jar from its many wrappings. Felice gasped as her eyes fell on it. Ah, oh, but yes, but yes, she cried eagerly. That is it. I would know it anywhere. Meanwhile, Lavington was making his own preparations. He removed all the ornaments from a small table and set it in the middle of the room. Round it, he placed three chairs. Then taking the blue jar from Jack... He placed it in the center of the table. Now, he said, we're ready. Turn off the lights and let us sit round the table in the darkness. The others obeyed him. Babington's voice spoke again out of the darkness. Think of nothing or of everything. Do not force the mind. It is possible that one of us has mediumistic powers. If so, that person will go into a trance. Remember, there is nothing to fear. Cast out fear from your hearts and drift. Drift. His voice died away and there was silence. Minute by minute, the silence seemed to grow more pregnant with possibilities. It was all very well for Lavington to say, cast out fear. It was not fear that Jack felt, it was panic and he was almost certain that Felice felt the same way. Suddenly he heard her voice, low and terrified. Something terrible is going to happen. I feel it. Cast out fear, said Lavington. Do not fight against the influence. The darkness seemed to get darker, and the silence more acute, and nearer and nearer came that indefinable sense of menace. Jack felt himself choking, stifling. The evil thing was very near. And then the moment of conflict passed. He was drifting, drifting downstream, his lids closed. Peace, darkness. Jack stirred slightly. His head was heavy, heavy as lead. Where was he? Sunshine birds. He lay staring up at the sky. Then it all came back to him. The sitting, the little room, the lees, and the doctor. What had happened? He sat up, his head throbbing unpleasantly, and looked round him. He was lying in a little copse not far from the cottage. No one else was near him. He took out his watch. To his amazement, it registered half past twelve. Jack struggled to his feet and ran as fast as he could in the direction of the cottage. They must have been alarmed by his failure to come out of the trance and carried him out into the open air. Arrived at the cottage, he knocked loudly on the door, but there was no answer and no signs of life about it. Well, they must have gone off to get help, or else... Jack felt an indefinable fear invade him. What had happened... He made his way back to the hotel as quickly as possible. 
He was about to make some inquiries at the office when he was diverted by a colossal punch in the ribs, which nearly knocked him off his feet. Turning in some indignation, he beheld a white-haired old gentleman wheezing with mirth. "'Didn't expect me, me boy! Didn't expect me, eh?' said this individual. "'Why, Uncle George, I thought you were miles away in Italy somewhere. Ha! but I wasn't! Landed at Dover last night!' thought I'd motor up to town and stop to see you on the way. And what did I find? Out all night, eh? Nice goings on, hmm? Uncle George. Jack checked him firmly. I've got the most extraordinary story to tell you. I dare say you won't believe it. I dare say I shan't, laughed the old man. <laughs> you do your best, me boy. <laughs> but I must have something to eat, continued Jack. I'm famished. He led the way to the dining room and over a substantial repast he narrated the whole story. And God knows what's become of them, he ended. His uncle seemed on the verge of apoplexy. The jar! he managed to ejaculate at last. The blue jar! What's become of that? Jack stared at him in non-comprehension, but submerged in the torrent of words that followed, he began to understand. It came with a rush. Ming! Unique gem of my collection worth ten thousand pounds at least. Offer from Hoggenheimer, the American millionaire, only one of its kind in the world. Confound it, sir, what have you done with my blue jar? Jack rushed from the room. He must find Lavington. The young lady at the office eyed him coldly. Dr. Lavington left late last night by motor. He left a note for you. Jack tore it open. It was short and to the point. My dear young friend, is the day of the supernatural over? Not quite, especially when tricked out in new scientific language. Kindest regards from Feliz, invalid father, and myself. We have twelve hours start, which ought to be ample. Yours ever, Ambrose Lavington, Doctor of the Soul. The Red Signal No, but how too thrilling, said pretty Mrs. Eversley, opening her lovely but slightly vacant eyes very wide. Always say women have a sixth sense. Do you think it's true, Sir Allington? The famous alienist smiled sardonically. He had an unbounded contempt for the foolish pretty type, such as his fellow guest. Allington West was the supreme authority on mental disease, and he was fully alive to his own position and importance, a slightly pompous man of full figure. A great deal of nonsense is talked. I know that, Mrs. Eversley. What does the term mean? A sixth sense? Oh, you scientific men are always so severe. And it really is extraordinary the way one seems to positively know things sometimes. Just know them, feel them. I mean, quite uncanny, it really is. Claire knows what I mean, don't you, Claire? She appealed to her hostess with a slight pout and a tilted shoulder. Claire Trent did not reply at once. It was a small dinner party. She and her husband, Violet Eversley, Sir Allington West, and his nephew Dermot West, who was an old friend of Jack Trent's. Jack Trent himself, a somewhat heavy, florid man with a good-humoured smile and a pleasant, lazy laugh, took up the thread. Bunkum, Violet! Your best friend is killed in a railway accident. Straight away you remember that you dreamt of a black cat last Tuesday. Marvellous. You felt all along that something was going to happen. Oh, no, Jack. You're mixing up premonitions with intuition now. Come now, Sir Allington. You must admit that premonitions are real. To a certain extent, perhaps, admitted the physician cautiously. But coincidence accounts for a good deal, and then there is the invariable tendency to make the most of a story afterwards. you always got to take that into account. I don't think there's any such thing as premonition, said Claire Trent rather abruptly, or intuition, or a sixth sense, or any of the things we talk about so glibly. We go through life like a train rushing through the darkness to an unknown destination. 
That's hardly a good simile, Mrs. Trent, said Dermot West, lifting his head for the first time and taking part in the discussion. There was a curious glitter in the clear grey eyes that shone out rather oddly from the deeply tanned face. You've forgotten the signals, you see. Signals? Yes, green, if it's all right, and red, for danger. Red, for danger? How thrilling! breathed Violet Eversley. Dermot turned from her rather impatiently. That's just a way of describing it, of course. Danger ahead, the red signal, look out. Trent stared at him curiously. You speak as though it were an actual experience, Dermot, old boy. So it is, has been, I mean. Give us the yarn. I can give you one instance. Out in Mesopotamia, just after the armistice, I came into my tent one evening with a feeling strong upon me. Danger. Look out. Hadn't the ghost of a notion what it was all about. I made a round of the camp, fussed unnecessarily, took all precautions against an attack by hostile Arabs, and then I went back to my tent. As soon as I got inside, the feeling popped up again stronger than ever. Danger. In the end, I took a blanket outside, rolled myself up in it, and slept there. Well? The next morning, when I went inside the tent, first thing I saw was a great knife arrangement about half a yard long, struck down through my bunk, just where I would have lain. I soon found out about it. One of the Arab servants, his son, had been shot as a spy. What have you got to say to that, Uncle Allington, as an example of what I call the red signal? The specialist smiled non-committally. A very interesting story, my dear Dermot. But not one that you would accept unreservedly. Oh, yes, yes, I have no doubt that you had the premonition of danger, just as you state. But it is the origin of the premonition I dispute. According to you, it came from without, impressed by some outside source upon your mentality. But nowadays we find that nearly everything comes from within, from our subconscious self. Good old subconscious, cried Jack Trent. It's the jack of all trades nowadays. Sir Allington continued without heeding the interruption. I suggest that by some glance or look this Arab had betrayed himself. Your conscious self didn't notice or remember, but with your subconscious self it was otherwise. The subconscious never forgets. We believe, too, that it can reason and deduce quite independently of the higher or conscious will. Your subconscious self, then, believed that an attempt might be made to assassinate you, and succeeded in forcing its fear upon your conscious realization. Well, that sounds very convincing, I admit, said Dermot, smiling. Oh, but not nearly so exciting, pouted Mrs. Eversley. It's um, also possible that you may have been subconsciously aware of the hate felt by the man towards you. Of what in the old days used to be called um, telepathy certainly exists, though the conditions governing it are very little understood. Have there been any other instances? asked Claire of Dermot. Oh, yes, but uh, nothing very pictorial, and I suppose they could all be explained under the heading of coincidence. I refused an invitation to a country house once for no other reason than the hoisting of the red signal. The place was burnt out during the week. By the way, Uncle Allington, where does the subconscious come in there? I'm afraid it doesn't, said Allington, smiling. But you've got an equally good explanation. Come now. No need to be tactful with near relatives. Well, then, nephew, I venture to suggest that you refuse the invitation for the ordinary reason that you didn't much want to go, and that after the fire you suggested to yourself that you had had a warning of danger, which explanation you now believe implicitly. Oh, it's hopeless, laughed Dermot. It's heads, you win, tails, I lose. Never mind, Mr. West, cried Violet Eversley. I believe in your red signal implicitly. Is the time in Mesopotamia the last time you had it? Yes, until... I beg your pardon? Nothing. Dermot sat silent. The words which had nearly left his lips were, Yes, until tonight. They'd come quite unbidden to his lips, voicing a thought which had as yet not been consciously realized, but he was aware at once that they were true. The red signal was looming up out of the darkness. Danger. 
danger at hand. But why? What conceivable danger could there be here? Here, in the house of his friends, at least. Well, yes, there was that kind of danger. He looked at Claire Trent, her whiteness, her slenderness, the exquisite droop of her golden head. But that danger had been there for some time. It was never likely to get acute. For Jack Trent was his best friend, and more than his best friend, the man who had saved his life in Flanders and had been recommended for the VC for doing so. A good fellow, Jack, one of the best. Damn bad luck that he should have fallen in love with Jack's wife. He'd get over it some day, he supposed. A thing couldn't go on hurting like this forever. One could starve it out. That was it. Starve it out. It was not as though she would ever guess. And if she did guess, there was no danger of her caring. Statue. A beautiful statue. A thing of gold and ivory and pale pink coral. A toy for a king. Not a real woman. Claire. The very thought of her name uttered silently. Hurt him. He must get over it. He'd cared for women before. But not like this, said something. Not like this. Well, there it was. No danger there. Heartache, yes, but not danger. Not the danger of the red signal. That was for something else. He looked round the table, and it struck him for the first time that it was rather an unusual little gathering. His uncle, for instance, seldom dined out in this small, informal way. It was not as though the Trents were old friends. Until this evening, Dermot had not been aware that he knew them at all. To be sure, there was an excuse. A rather notorious medium was coming after dinner to give a seance. Sir Addington professed to be mildly interested in spiritualism. Yes, that, that was an excuse, certainly. The word forced itself on his notice. An excuse. Was the séance just an excuse to make the specialist presence at dinner natural? If so, what was the real object of his being here? A host of details came rushing into Dermot's mind, trifles unnoticed at the time, or, as his uncle would have said, unnoticed by the conscious mind. The great physician had looked oddly, very oddly, at Claire more than once. He seemed to be watching her. She was uneasy under his scrutiny. She made little twitching motions with her hands. She was nervous, horribly nervous. And was it, could it be, frightened? Why was she frightened? With a jerk, he came back to the conversation round the table. Mrs. Eversley had got the great man talking upon his own subject. My dear lady, he was saying, what is madness? I can assure you that the more we study the subject, the more difficult we find it to pronounce. We all practice a certain amount of self-deception, and when we carry it so far as to believe we are the Tsar of Russia, we are shut up or restrained. But there is a long road before we reach that point. At what particular spot on it shall we erect a post and say, on this side, sanity, on the other, madness, it can't be done, you know. And I will tell you this. If the man suffering from a delusion happened to hold his tongue about it, in all probability we should never be able to distinguish him from a normal individual. The extraordinary sanity of the insane is a most interesting subject. Sir Allington sipped his wine with appreciation and beamed upon the company. I always heard they're very cunning, remarked Mrs. Eversley. A loonies, I mean. Oh, remarkably so. And suppression of one's particular delusion has a disastrous effect very often. All suppressions are dangerous, as psychoanalysis has taught us. The man who has a harmless eccentricity and can indulge it as such seldom goes over the borderline. But the man, suppose, or woman, who is to all appearance perfectly normal, may be in reality uh, a poignant source of danger to the community. His gaze travelled gently down the table to Claire and then back again. He sipped his wine once more. A horrible fear shook Dermot. Was that what he meant? Was that what he was driving at? Why, it's impossible, but... And all from suppressing oneself, sighed Mrs. Eversley. I quite see that one should be very careful always to, to, to express one's personality. 
dangers of the other are frightful. My dear Mrs. Eversley, expostulated the physician, you have quite misunderstood me. The cause of the mischief is in the physical matter of the brain, sometimes arising from some outward agency, and such as a blow, sometimes, alas, congenital. A heredity is so sad, sighed the lady vaguely. Consumption and all that. Tuberculosis is not hereditary, said Sir Ellington dryly. Oh, isn't it? I always thought it was. But madness is. How dreadful. What else? Gout, said Sir Allington, smiling. And colour blindness. The latter is rather interesting. It is transmitted direct to males, but is latent in females. So while there are many colour blind men, for a woman to be colour blind, it must have been latent in her mother as well as present in her father. Rather an unusual state of things to occur. That is what is called sex limited heredity. Oh, interesting. But madness is not like that is it? Madness can be handed down to men or women equally, said the physician gravely. Claire rose suddenly, pushing back her chair so abruptly that it overturned and fell to the ground. She was very pale, and the nervous motions of her fingers were very apparent. You, you, you will not be long, will you? she begged. Mrs. Thompson will be here in a few minutes now. Oh, one glass of port, and I will be with you for one, declared Sir Ellington. To see this wonderful Mrs. Thompson's performance is what I've come for, isn't it? <laughs> ah, yes. Not, not that I needed any inducement. He bowed. Claire gave a faint smile of acknowledgement and passed out of the room, her hand on Mrs. Eversley's shoulder. Afraid I've been talking shop, remarked the physician as he resumed his seat. Forgive me, my dear fellow. Not at all, said Trent, perfunctorily. He looked strained and worried. For the first time, Dermot felt an outsider in the company of his friend. Between these two was a secret that even an old friend might not share. And yet the whole thing was fantastic and incredible. What did he to go upon? Nothing but a couple of glances and a woman's nervousness. They lingered over their wine but a very short time and arrived up in the drawing-room just as Mrs. Thompson was announced. The medium was a plump, middle-aged woman, atrociously dressed in magenta velvet, with a loud, rather common voice. I am not late, Mrs. Trent, she said cheerily. You did say nine o'clock, didn't you? You're quite punctual, Mrs. Thompson, said Claire in her sweet, slight, husky voice. This is our little circle. No further introductions were made, as was evidently the custom. The medium swept them all with a shrewd, penetrating eye. I hope we shall get some good results, she remarked briskly. I can't tell you how I hate it when I go out and I can't give satisfaction, so to speak. It just makes me mad. But I think Shiromako, my Japanese control, you know, will be able to get through all right tonight. I'm feeling ever so fit and I refuse the Welsh rabbit, fond of toasted cheese though I am. Dermot listened, half amused, half disgusted. How prosaic the whole thing was. And yet, was he not judging foolishly? Everything, after all, was natural. The powers claimed by mediums were natural powers, as yet imperfectly understood. A great surgeon might be wary of indigestion on the eve of a delicate operation. Why not Mrs. Thompson? Chairs were arranged in a circle. Lights so that they could conveniently be raised or lowered. Dermot noticed that there was no question of tests, or of Sir Allington satisfying himself as to the conditions of the sales. Oh, this business of Mrs. Thompson was only a blind. Sir Allington was here for quite another purpose. Clare's mother, Dermot remembered, had died abroad. There had been some mystery about her, hereditary. Uh, with a jerk, he forced his mind back to the surroundings of the moment. Everyone took their places, and the lights were turned out, all but a small red-shaded one on a far table. For a while, nothing was heard but the low, even breathing of the medium. 
Gradually it grew more and more stertorous. Then, with a suddenness that made Dermot jump, a loud rap came from the far end of the room. It was repeated from the other side. Then a perfect crescendo of raps was heard. They died away, and a sudden high peal of mocking laughter rang through the room. Then silence broken by a voice utterly unlike that of Mrs. Thompson, a high-pitched, quaintly inflected voice. I am here, gentlemen, it said. Yeah, I am here. You wish to ask me things. Who are you? Shiramako? Yes. I, Shiramako. I passed over a long time ago. I work. Side 4 Further details of Shiromako's life followed. It was all very flat and uninteresting, and Dermot had heard it often before. Everyone was happy, very happy. Messages were given from vaguely described relatives, the description being so loosely worded as to fit almost any contingency. An elderly lady, the mother of someone present, held the floor for some time, imparting copybook maxims with an air of refreshing novelty, hardly borne out by her subject matter. So are else, what a guess who now? announced Shiromako. Got a very proper message for one of you gentlemen. There was a pause, and then a new voice spoke prefacing its remark with an evil, demoniacal chuckle. <laughs> Better not go home. Better not go home. Take my advice. Who are you speaking to? asked Trent. One of you three. I shouldn't go home if I were him. Danger? Blood? Not very much blood. Quite enough. No. Don't go home. The voice grew fainter. Don't go home. It died away completely. Dermot felt his blood tingling. He was convinced that the warning was meant for him. Somehow or other there was danger abroad tonight. There was a sigh from the medium, and then a groan. She was coming round. The lights were turned on, and presently she sat upright, her eyes blinking a little. Go off well, my dear, I hope so. Oh, very good indeed, thank you, Mrs. Thompson. Shiromako, I suppose. Yes, and others, Mrs. Thompson yawned. Oh, dead beat, absolutely down and out. Does fairly take it out of you. Well, I'm glad it was a success. I was a bit afraid it mightn't be. Afraid something disagreeable might happen. There's a queer feel about this room tonight. She glanced over each ample shoulder in turn and then shrugged them uncomfortably. I don't like it, she said. Any sudden deaths among any of you people lately? What do you mean, among us? Near relatives, near friends, no? Well, if I wanted to be melodramatic, I'd say there was death in the air tonight. Mm. Ah, it's only my nonsense. Goodbye, Mrs. Chen. I'm glad you've been satisfied. Mrs. Thompson, in her magenta velvet gown, went out. I hope you've been interested, Sir Allington, murmured Clare. It was the most interesting evening, my dear lady. Many thanks for the opportunity. Let me wish you good night. You're all going to a dance, are you not? Won't you come with us? Oh, no, no. I, I make it a rule to be in bed by half past eleven. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Eversley. Ah, Dermot, I rather want to have a word with you. Can you come with me now? You can rejoin the others at the Grafton Galleries. Certainly, Uncle. I'll meet you there, then, Trent. Very few words were exchanged between Uncle and Nephew during the short drive to Harley Street. 
Sir Allington made a semi-apology for dragging Dermot away, and assured him that he would only detain him a few minutes. "'Shall I keep the car for you, my boy?' he asked as they alighted. "'Oh, no, don't bother, Uncle. I'll pick up a taxi.' "'Oh, very good. I don't like to keep Charleston up later than I can help. "'Good night, Charleston. Now where the devil did I put my key?' The car glided away as Sir Allington stood on the steps, vainly searching his pockets. "'Must have left it in my other coat,' he said at length. "'Ring the bell, will you? Johnson is still up, I dare say.' The imperturbable Johnson did indeed open the door within sixty seconds. "'Mislaid my key, Johnson,' explained Sir Allington. "'Bring a couple of whiskies and sodas into the library, will you?' "'Very good, Sir Allington.' The physician strode on into the library and turned on the lights. He motioned to Dermot to close the door behind him after entering. "'I won't keep you long, Dermot, but there's just something I want to say to you. "'Is it some... Uh, my fancy, or have you a certain... Uh, um, Tendress, shall we say, for Mrs. Jack Trent? The blood rushed to Dermot's face. Jack Trent is my best friend. Uh, pardon me, but that's hardly answering my question. I dare say that you consider my views on divorce and such matters highly puritanical, but I must remind you that you are my only near relative and that you are my heir. There is no question of a divorce, said Dermot angrily. There certainly is not, for a reason which I understand perhaps better than you do. That particular reason I cannot give you now, but I do wish to warn you. Claire Trent is not for you. The young man faced his uncle's gaze steadily. I do understand, and permit me to say, perhaps better than you think. I know the reason for your presence at dinner tonight. Where? Eh? The physician was clearly startled. How did you know that? Call it a guess, sir. I'm right, am I not, when I say that you were there in your professional capacity? Sir Allington strode up and down. You are quite right, Dermot. I could not, of course, have told you so myself, though I'm afraid it will soon be common property. Dermot's heart contracted. You mean that you have made up your mind? Yes. There is insanity in the family. On the mother's side. Sad case. Very sad case. I can't believe it, sir. I dare say not. To the layman there are few, if any, signs apparent. And to the expert? All the evidence is conclusive. In such a case, the patient must be placed under restraint as soon as possible. My God! breathed Dermot. But you can't shut anyone up for nothing at all. My dear Dermot! Cases are only placed under restraint when their being at large would result in danger to the community. Very grave danger. In all probability, a peculiar form of homicidal mania. It was so in the mother's case. Dermot turned away with a groan, burying his face in his hands. Claire. White and golden Claire. In the circumstances... Continue the position comfortably. I felt it incumbent upon me to warn you. Claire. Hermit, Dermot. My poor Claire. Yes, indeed. We must all pity her. Suddenly Dermot raised his head. I don't believe it. What? I say I don't believe it. Doctors make mistakes. Everyone knows that. And they're always keen on their own speciality. My dear Dermot, cried Sir Allington angrily, I tell you, I don't believe it. And anyway, even if it is so, I don't care. I love Claire. If she will come with me, I shall take her away, far away, out of the reach of meddling physicians. I shall guard her, care for her, shelter her with my love. You will do nothing of the sort, are you mad? Dermot laughed scornfully. You would say so, I dare say. Understand me, Dermot. Sir Allington's face was red with suppressed passion. If you do this thing, this shameful thing, it is the end. I shall withdraw the allowance I am now making you, and I shall make a new will, leaving all I possess to various hospitals. Do as you please with your damned money, said Dermot in a low voice. 
I shall have the woman I love. A woman who... Say a word against her, and by God, I'll kill you! I Dermot. A slight clink of glasses made them both swing round. Unheard by them in the heat of their argument, Johnson had entered with a tray of glasses. His face was the imperturbable one of the good servant. But Dermot wondered how much he'd overheard. Well do, Johnson, said Sir Allington curtly. You can go to bed. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Johnson withdrew. The two men looked at each other. The momentary interruption had calmed the storm. Uncle, said Dermot, I shouldn't have spoken to you as I did. I can quite see that from your point of view you are perfectly right, but I have loved Claire Trent for a long time. The fact that Jack Trent is my best friend has hitherto stood in the way of my ever speaking of love to Claire herself. But in these circumstances, that fact no longer counts. The idea that any monetary conditions can deter me is absurd. I think we've both said all there is to be said. Good night. Dermot! It's really no good arguing further. Good night, Uncle Allington. I'm sorry. But there it is. He went out quickly, shutting the door behind him. The hall was in darkness. He passed through it opened the front door, and emerged into the street, banging the door behind him. A taxi had just deposited a fare at a house farther along the street, and Dermot hailed it and drove to the Grafton Galleries. In the door of the ballroom he stood for a minute, bewildered, his head spinning. The raucous jazz music, the smiling women. It was as though he had stepped into another world. Had he dreamt it all? Impossible that that grim conversation with his uncle should have really taken place. There was Claire, floating past, like a lily in her white and silver gown that fitted sheath-like to her slenderness. She smiled at him, her face calm and serene. Surely it was all a dream. The dance had stopped. Presently she was near him, smiling up into his face. As in a dream, he asked her to dance. She was in his arms now. The raucous melodies had begun again. He felt her flag a little. Tired? You want to stop? If you don't mind. Can we go somewhere where we can talk? There's something I want to say to you. Not a dream. He came back to earth with a bump. Could he ever have thought her face calm and serene? It was haunted with anxiety, with dread. How much did she know? He found a quiet corner, and they sat down side by side. Well, he said, assuming a lightness he did not feel, you said you had something you wanted to say to me. Yes. Her eyes were cast down. She was playing nervously with the tassel of her gown. It's difficult... Brother, tell me, Claire, it's just this. I want you to, to go away for a time. He was astonished. Whatever he had expected, it was not this. You want me to go away? Why? Best to be honest, isn't it? I, 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 I know that you are a... A gentleman and my friend. I want you to go away because that I I have let myself get fond of you. Claire. Her words left him dumb, tongue tied. Please do not think that I am conceited enough to fancy that you that you would ever be likely to fall in love with me. It's only that I'm not very happy. And I would rather you went away. Claire, don't you know that I have cared, cared damnably ever since I met you? She lifted startled eyes to his face. You cared. You have cared a long time since the beginning. Oh, she cried. Why didn't you tell me then when I could have come to you? 
Why tell me now when it's too late? Oh, I'm, I'm mad. I don't know what I'm saying. I could never have come to you. Claire, what did you mean when you said, now that it's too late? Is it, is it because of my uncle? What he knows? What he thinks? She nodded dumbly, the tears running down her face. Listen, Claire, you're not to believe all that. You're not even to think about it. Instead, you will come away with me. We'll go to the South Seas, to islands like green jewels. You will be happy there, and I will look after you, keep you safe for always. His arms went round her. He drew her to him, felt her tremble at his touch. Then suddenly she wrenched herself free. Oh, no, no, please. Can't you see? I couldn't now. It would be ugly, ugly, ugly. All along I wanted to be good, and now it would be ugly as well. He hesitated, baffled by her words. She looked at him appealingly. Please, she said, I want to be good. Without a word, Dermot got up and left her. For the moment, he was touched and racked by her words beyond argument. He went for his hat and coat, running into Trent as he did so. Hello, Dermot, you're off early. Yes, I'm not in the mood for dancing tonight. It's a rotten night, said Trent gloomily. But you haven't got my worries. Dermot had a sudden panic that Trent might be going to confide in him. Not that, anything but that. Well, so long, he said hurriedly. I'm off home. Home, eh? What about the warning of the spirits? I'll risk that. Good night, Jack. Dermot's flat was not far away. He walked there, feeling the need of the cool night air to calm his fevered brain. He let himself in with his key and switched on the light in the bedroom. And all at once, for the second time that night, a feeling that he had designated by the title of the Red Signal surged over him. So overpowering was it that for the moment it swept even Claire from his mind. Danger. He was in danger. At this very moment and in this very room. He tried in vain to ridicule himself free of the fear. Perhaps his efforts were secretly half-hearted. So far, the red signal had given him timely warning which had enabled him to avoid disaster. Smiling a little at his own superstition, he made a careful tour of the flat. It was possible that some malefactor had got in and was lying concealed there, but his search revealed nothing. His man, Milson, was away, and the flat was absolutely empty. He returned to his bedroom and undressed slowly, frowning to himself. The sense of danger was acute as ever. He went to a drawer to get out a handkerchief, and suddenly stood stock still. There was an unfamiliar lump in the middle of the drawer, something hard. His quick, nervous fingers tore aside the handkerchiefs and took out the object concealed beneath them. It was a revolver. With the utmost astonishment, Dermot examined it keenly. It was of a somewhat unfamiliar pattern, and one shot had been fired from it lately. Beyond that, he could make nothing of it. Someone had placed it in that drawer that very evening. It had not been there when he dressed for dinner. He was sure of that. He was about to replace it in the drawer when he was startled by a bell ringing. It rang again and again, sounding unusually loud in the quietness of the empty flat. Who could it be coming to the front door at this hour? And only one answer came to the question. An answer instinctive and persistent. Danger, danger, danger. Led by some instinct for which he didn't account, Dermot switched off his light, slipped on an overcoat that lay across a chair, and opened the hall door. Two men stood outside. Beyond them, Dermot caught sight of a blue uniform. A policeman. Mr. West asked the foremost of the two men. 
It seemed to Dermot that ages elapsed before he answered. In reality, it was only a few seconds before he replied in a very fair imitation of his man's expressionless voice. Mr. West hasn't come in yet. What do you want with him at this time of night? Hasn't come in yet, eh? Very well, then I think we'd better come in and wait for him. No, you don't. See here, my man. My name is Inspector Verrall of Scotland Yard, and I've got a warrant for the arrest of your master. You can see it if you like. Dermot perused the proffered paper, or pretended to do so, asking in a dazed voice, What for? What's he done? Murder. Sir Addington West of Harley Street. His brain in a whirl, Dermot fell back before his redoubtable visitors. He went into the sitting room and switched on the light. The inspector followed him. Have a search round, he directed the other man. Then he turned to Dermot. You stay here, my man. No slipping off to warn your master. What's your name, by the way? Wilson, sir. What time do you expect your master in, Milson? I don't know, sir. He was going to a dance, I believe, with the Grafton Galleries. He left there just under an hour ago. You sure he's not been back here? I don't think so, sir. I fancy I should have heard him come in. At this moment, the second man came in from the adjoining room. In his hand, he carried a revolver. He took it across to the inspector in some excitement. An expression of satisfaction flitted across the latter's face. That settles it, he remarked. Must have slipped in and out without your hearing him. Well, he's hooked it by now. I'd better be off. Corley, you stay here in case he should come back again, and you keep an eye on this fellow. He may know more about his master than he pretends. The inspector bustled off. Dermot endeavoured to get at the details of the affair from Corley, who was quite ready to be talkative. Oh, pretty clear case, he vouchsafed. The murder was discovered almost immediately. Johnson, the manservant, had only just gone up to bed when he fancied he heard a shot and came down again. Found Sir Ainsen dead, shot through the heart, rang us up at once, and we came along and heard his story. Which made it a pretty clear case, ventured Dermot. Oh, absolutely, this young West came in with his uncle, and they were quarrelling when Johnson brought in the drinks. The old boy was threatening to make a new will, and your master was talking about shooting him. Not five minutes later, the shot was heard. Oh, yes, clear enough, silly young fool. Fair enough indeed. Dermot's heart sank as he realised the overwhelming nature of the evidence against him. Danger indeed. Horrible danger. And no way out save that of flight. He set his wits to work. Presently he suggested making a cup of tea. Corley assented readily enough. He had already searched the flat and knew there was no back entrance. Dermot was permitted to depart to the kitchen. Once there he put the kettle on and chinked cups and saucers industriously. Then he stole swiftly to the window and lifted the sash. The flat was on the second floor, and outside the window was a small wire lift used by tradesmen, which ran up and down on its steel cable. Like a flash, Dermot was outside the window and swinging himself down the wire rope. It cut into his hands, making them bleed, but he went on desperately. A few minutes later he was emerging cautiously from the back of the block, Turning the corner, he cannoned into a figure standing by the sidewalk. To his utter amazement, he recognised Jack Trent. Trent was fully alive to the perils of the situation. My God, Dermot! Quick, don't hang about here! Taking him by the arm, he led him down a by street and then down another. A lonely taxi was sighted and hailed, and they jumped in, Trent giving the man his own address. Save his place for the moment. There we can decide what to do next, to put those fools off the track. I came round here hoping to be able to warn you before the police got here, but I was too late. I didn't even know that you'd heard of it. Jack, you don't believe... Of course not, old fellow, not for one minute. I know you far too well. All the same, it's a nasty business for you. They came round asking questions. What time you got to the Grafton Galleries when you left, etc. Dermot, who could have done the old boy in? I can't imagine... Whoever did it put the revolver in my drawer, I suppose. Must have been watching us pretty closely. That seance business was damn funny. Don't go home. Meant for poor old West. He did go home. And got shot. It applies to me too, said Dermot. I went home and found a planted revolver and a police inspector. Well, I hope it doesn't get me too, said Trent. Here we are. He paid the taxi, opened the door with his latch key and guided Dermot up the dark stairs to his den, which was a small room on the first floor. 
He threw open the door and Dermot walked in whilst Trent switched on the light and then came to join him. Pretty safe here for the time being, he remarked. Now we can get our heads together and decide what's best to be done. I've made a fool of myself, said Dermot suddenly. I ought to have faced it out. I see more clearly now. The whole thing's a plot. What the devil are you laughing at? But Trent was leaning back in his chair, shaking with unrestrained mirth. There was something horrible in the sound. Something horrible, too, about the man altogether. There was a curious light in his eyes. <laughs> Damned clever plot! <laughs> he gasped out. <laughs> Damn it, my boy! You're done for! He drew the telephone towards him. What are you going to do? asked Dermot. Bring up Scotland Yard! Tell them they're birds here, safe under lock and key. <laughs> yes, I locked the door when I came in, and the key's in my pocket. No good looking at that other door behind me that leads into Claire's room, and she always locks it on her side. She's afraid of me, you know. Been afraid of me a long time. She always knows what I'm thinking about that knife. A long, sharp knife. I oh, know you don't. Dermot had been about to make a rush at him, but the other had suddenly produced an ugly-looking revolver. "'That's the second of them,' chuckled Trent. "'I put the first of them in your drawer after shooting Old West with it. <laughs> "'What are you looking at over my head? "'That door? It's no use, even if Claire was to open it, and she might. "'To you, I'd shoot you before you got there. "'Not in the heart.' Not to kill, just wing you, so that you couldn't get away. I'm a jolly good shot, you know. I saved your life once. More fool I. Oh, no, no, I want you hanged. Yes, hanged. It isn't you I want the knife for. It's Claire. Pretty Claire, so white and soft. Old West knew. That's what he was here for tonight, to see if I was mad or not. He wanted to shut me up, so that I shouldn't get Claire with a knife. I was very cunning. I took his latch key and yours, too. I slipped away from the dance as soon as I got there. I saw you come out from his house, and I went in. I shot him, and I came away at once, and then I went to your place and left the revolver. I was at the Grafton Galleries again almost as soon as you were, and I put the latch key back in your coat pocket when I was saying good night to you. I don't mind telling you all this. There's no one else to hear, and when you're being hanged, I'd like you to know that I did it. God, <laughs> how it makes me laugh! <laughs> what, what are you thinking of? What the devil are you looking at? I'm thinking of some words you quoted just now. You'd have done better, Trent, not to come home. What do you mean? Look behind you. Trent spun round. In the doorway of the communicating room stood Claire and Inspector Beryl. Trent was quick. The revolver spoke just once and found its mark. He fell forward across the table. The inspector sprang to his side as Dermot stared at Clare in a dream. Thoughts flashed through his brain disjointedly. His uncle, their quarrel, the colossal misunderstanding the divorce laws of England which would never free Clare from an insane husband. We must all pity her. The plot between her and Sir Allington, which the cunning of Trent had seen through, her cry to him, ugly, ugly, ugly. Yes, but now... The inspector straightened up again. Dead, he said vexedly. Yes, Dermot heard himself saying. He was always a good shot. S O S. Ah, said Mr. Dinsmead appreciatively. He stepped back and surveyed the round table with approval. The firelight gleamed on the coarse white tablecloth, the knives and forks, and the other table appointments. Is, uh, is everything ready? 
asked Mrs. Dinsmead hesitatingly. She was a little faded woman with colorless face, meager hair scraped back from her forehead, and a perpetually nervous manner. Everything's ready, said her husband with a kind of ferocious geniality. He was a big man with stooping shoulders and a broad red face. He had little pig's eyes that twinkled under his bushy brows and a big jowl devoid of hair. Lemonade, suggested Mrs. Dinsmead almost in a whisper. Her husband shook his head. Tea, much better in every way. Look at the weather, streaming and blowing. A nice cup of hot tea is what's needed for supper in an evening like this. He winked facetiously, then fell to surveying the table again. A good dish of eggs, cold corned beef, and bread and cheese. That's my order for supper. So come along, get it ready, mother. Charles in the kitchen, waiting to give you a hand. Mrs. Dinsmead rose, carefully winding up the ball of her knitting. She's grown a very good-looking girl, she murmured. Sweetly pretty, I say. Ah, said Mr. Dinsmead, the mortal image of her ma. So go along with you and don't let's waste any more time. He strolled about the room, humming to himself for a minute or two. Once he approached the window and looked out. Wild weather, he murmured to himself. A much likelihood of our having visitors tonight. Then he too left the room. About ten minutes later, Mrs. Dinsmead entered, bearing a dish of fried eggs. Her two daughters followed, bringing in the rest of the provisions. Mr. Dinsmead and his son, Johnny, brought up the rear. The former seated himself at the head of the table. And for what we are to receive, etc., he remarked humorously, and blessings on the man who first thought of tin foods. What would we do, I should like to know, miles from anywhere, if we hadn't a tin now and then to fall back upon when the butcher forgets his weekly call? He proceeded to carve corned beef dexterously. I wonder who ever thought of building a house like this miles from anywhere, said his daughter Magdalene pettishly. We never see a soul. No, said her father. Never a soul. I can't think what made you take it, father, said Charlotte. Can't you, my girl? Well, I had my reasons. I had my reasons. His eyes sought his wife's furtively, but she frowned. And haunted, too, said Charlotte. I wouldn't sleep alone here for anything. Pack of nonsense, cried her father. Never seen anything of you. Come now. Not seen anything, perhaps, but... But what? Charlotte did not reply, but she shivered a little. A great surge of rain came driving against the window pane, and Mrs. Dinsmead dropped a spoon with a tinkle on the tray. Not nervous, are you, mother? said Mr. Dinsmead. It's a wild night after all. Don't you worry, we're safe here by our fireside, and not a soul from outside likely to disturb us. Why, it'd be a miracle if anyone did, and miracles don't happen. Oh, he added as though to himself with a kind of peculiar satisfaction. Miracles don't happen. As the words left his lips, there came a sudden knocking at the door. Mr. Dinsmead stayed as though petrified. Whatever's that? He muttered. His jaw fell. Mrs. Dinsmead gave a little whimpering cry and pulled her shawl up round her. The colour came into Magdalene's face, and she leant forward and spoke to her father. The miracle has happened, she said. You'd better go and let whoever it is in. Twenty minutes earlier, Mortimer Cleveland had stood in the driving rain and mist surveying his car. It was really cursed bad luck. Two punctures within ten minutes of each other, and here he was, stranded miles from anywhere, in the midst of these bare Wiltshire downs, with night coming on and no prospect of shelter. Serve him a right for trying to take a short cut, if only he had stuck to the main road. Now he was lost on what seemed a mere cart track, and no idea if there were even a village anywhere near. He looked round him perplexedly, and his eye was caught by a gleam of light on the hillside above him. A second later the mist obscured it once more, but waiting patiently he presently got a second glimpse of it. 
After a moment's cogitation, he left the car and struck up the side of the hill. Soon, he was out of the mist, and he recognized the light as shining from the lighted window of a small cottage. Here, at any rate, was shelter. Mortimer Cleveland quickened his pace, bending his head to meet the furious onslaught of wind and rain, which seemed to be trying its best to drive him back. Cleveland was, in his own way, something of a celebrity, though doubtless the majority of folks would have displayed complete ignorance of his name and achievements. He was an authority on mental science, and had written two excellent textbooks on the subconscious. He was also a member of the Psychical Research Society, and a student of the occult in so far as it affected his own conclusions and line of research. He was, by nature, peculiarly susceptible to atmosphere, and by deliberate training he had increased his own natural gift. When he had at last reached the cottage and rapped the door, he was conscious of an excitement, a quickening of interest, as though all his faculties had suddenly been sharpened. The murmur of voices within had been plainly audible to him. Upon his knock there came a sudden silence, then the sound of a chair being pushed back along the floor. In another minute the door was flung open by a boy of about fifteen. Cleveland looked straight over his shoulder upon the scene within. It reminded him of an interior by some Dutch master, a round table spread for a meal, a family party sitting round it, one or two flickering candles, and the firelight's glow over all. A father, a big man, sat one side of the table. A little grey woman with a frightened face sat opposite him. Facing the door, looking straight at Cleveland, was a girl. Her startled eyes looked straight into his. A hand with a cup in it was arrested halfway to her lips. She was, Cleveland saw at once, a beautiful girl of an extremely uncommon type. Her hair, red gold, stood out round her face like a mist. Her eyes, very far apart, were a pure grey. She had the mouth and chin of an early Italian Madonna. End of Side 4 End of Side 4 End of Side 4 End of Side 4 Side 5 There was a moment's dead silence. Then Cleveland stepped into the room and explained his predicament. He brought his trite story to a close, and there was another pause, harder to understand. At last, as though with an effort, the father rose. Come in, sir. Mr. Cleveland, did you say? That is my name, said Mortimer, smiling. Ah, yes. Well, come in, Mr. Cleveland. Not weather for a dog outside, is it? Come in by the fire. Shut the door, can't you, Johnny? Don't stand there half the night. Cleveland came forward and sat on a wooden stool by the fire. The boy, Johnny, shut the door. Ben's maid, that's my name, said the other man. It was all geniality now. This is the missus. And these are my two daughters, Charlotte and Magdalene. For the first time, Cleveland saw the face of the girl who had been sitting with her back to him, and saw that in a totally different way she was quite as beautiful as her sister. Very dark, with a face of marble pallor, a delicate aquiline nose, and a grave mouth. It was a kind of frozen beauty, austere and almost forbidding. She acknowledged her father's introduction by bending her head, and she looked at him with an intent gaze that was searching in character. It was as though she was summing him up, weighing him in the balance of her young judgment. A drop of something to drink, eh, Mr. Cleveland? Thank you, said Mortimer. A cup of tea will meet the case admirably. Mr. Dinsmead hesitated a minute. Then he picked up the five cups, one after another, from the table, and emptied them into a slop bowl. This tea's cold, he said brusquely. Make us some more, will you, mother? Mrs. Dinsmead got up quickly and hurried off with the teapot. Mortimer had an idea she was glad to get out of the room. 
The fresh tea soon came, and the unexpected guest was plied with viands. Mr. Dinsmead talked and talked. He was expansive, genial, loquacious. He told the stranger all about himself. He'd lately retired from the building trade. Yes, made quite a good thing of it. He and the missus thought they'd like a bit of country air. Never lived in the country before. Wrong time of year to choose, of course. October and November, but they didn't want to wait. Life's uncertain, you know, sir. So they had taken this cottage, eight miles from anywhere and nineteen miles from anything you could call a town. No, they didn't complain. Girls found it a bit dull, but he and mother enjoyed the quiet. So he talked on, leaving Mortimer almost hypnotized by the easy flow. Nothing here, surely, but rather commonplace domesticity. And yet, at that first glimpse of the interior, he had diagnosed something else, some tension, some strain, emanating from one of those five people. He didn't know which. Mere foolishness. His nerves were all awry. They were all startled by his sudden appearance, that was all. He broached the question of a night's lodging and was met with a ready response. You'll have to stop with us, Mr. Cleveland. Nothing else for miles around. We can give you a bedroom, and though my pyjamas may be a bit roomy, why, they're better than nothing, and your own clothes will be dry by morning. It's very good of you. Not at all, said the other genially. As I said just now, one couldn't turn away a dog on a night like this. Magdalene, Charlotte, go up and see to the room. The two girls left the room. Presently Mortimer heard them moving about overhead. I can quite understand that two attractive young ladies like your daughters might find it dull here, said Cleveland. Good lookers, aren't they? said Mr. Dinsmead with fatherly pride. Not much like their mother or myself. We're a homely pair, but much attached to each other. <laughs> I'll tell you that, Mr. Cleveland, eh, Maggie? Isn't that so? Mrs. Dinsmead smiled primly. She had started knitting again. The needles clicked busily. She was a fast knitter. Presently, the room was announced ready, and Mortimer, expressing thanks once more, declared his intention of turning in. Did you put the hot water bottle in the bed? demanded Mrs. Dinsmead, suddenly mindful of her house pride. Yes, Mother, too. That's right, said Dinsmead. Go up with him, girls, and see that there's nothing else he wants. Magdalen went over to the window and saw that the fastenings were secure. Charlotte cast a final eye over the washstand appointments. Then they both lingered by the door. Good night, Mr. Cleveland. You're sure there is everything? Oh, yes, thank you, Miss Magdalen. I am ashamed to have given you both so much trouble. Good night. Good night. They went out, shutting the door behind them. Mortimer Cleveland was alone. He undressed slowly and thoughtfully. When he had donned Mr. Dinsmead's pink pajamas, he gathered up his own wet clothes and put them outside the door as his host had bade him. From downstairs he could hear the rumble of Dinsmead's voice. What a talker the man was! Altogether an odd personality. Indeed, there was something odd about the whole family, or was it his imagination? He went slowly back into his room and shut the door. He stood by the bed, lost in thought. Then he started. The mahogany table by the bed was smothered in dust. Written in the dust were three letters, clearly visible. S-O-S. Mortimer stared as if he could hardly believe his eyes. It was confirmation of all his vague surmises and forebodings. He was right, then. Something was wrong in this house. S.O.S. -S, a call for help. But whose finger had written it in the dust? Magdalene's or Charlotte's? They both stood there, he remembered, for a moment or two before going out of the room. Whose hand had secretly dropped to the table and traced out those three letters. The faces of the two girls came up before him, Magdalene's, dark and aloof, and Charlotte's, as he had seen it first, wide-eyed, startled, with an un.
unfathomable something in her glance. He went again to the door and opened it. The boom of Mr. Dinsmead's voice was no longer to be heard. The house was silent. He thought to himself, I can do nothing tonight. Tomorrow, well, we shall see. Cleveland woke early. He went down through the living room and out into the garden. The morning was fresh and beautiful after the rain. Someone else was up early, too. At the bottom of the garden, Charlotte was leaning on the fence, staring out over the downs. His pulse quickened a little as he went down to join her. All along he had been secretly convinced that it was Charlotte who had written the message. As he came up to her, she turned and wished him good morning. Her eyes were direct and childlike, with no hint of a secret understanding in them. A very good morning, said Mortimer, smiling. Whether this morning is a contrast to last night, it is indeed. Mortimer broke off a twig from a tree nearby. With it he began idly to draw on the smooth, sandy patch at his feet. He traced an S, then an O, then an S, watching the girl narrowly as he did so, but again he could detect no gleam of comprehension. Do you know what these letters represent, he said abruptly. Charlotte frowned a little. Aren't they what boats, liners, send out when they are in distress? She asked. Mortimer nodded. Someone wrote that on the table by my bed last night, he said quietly. I thought perhaps you might have done so. She looked at him in wide-eyed astonishment. I? Oh, no. He was wrong, then. A sharp pang of disappointment shot through him. He had been so sure, so sure. It was not often that his intuitions led him astray. You are quite certain, he persisted. Oh, yes. They turned and went slowly together towards the house. Charlotte seemed preoccupied about something. She replied at random to the few observations he made. Suddenly she burst out in a low, hurried voice. It, it's odd you're asking about those letters, S.O.S. I didn't write them, of course, but I so easily might have done. He stopped and looked at her, and she went on quickly. It sounds silly, I know, but I'd been so frightened, so dreadfully frightened, and when you came in last night it seemed like... like an answer to something. What are you frightened of? he asked quickly. I don't know. You don't know? I think... It's the house. Ever since we came here, it has been growing and growing. Everyone seems different somehow. Father, mother, and Magdalene, they all seem different. Mortimer did not speak at once, and before he could do so, Charlotte went on again. You know, this house is supposed to be haunted. What? All his interest was quickened. Oh, yes. A man murdered his wife in it, oh, some years ago now. We only found out about it after we got here. Father says ghosts are all nonsense, but I don't know. Mortimer was thinking rapidly. Tell me, he said in a business-like tone, was this murder committed in the room I had last night? I don't know anything about that, said Charlotte. I wonder now, said Mortimer half to himself. Yes, that may be it. Charlotte looked at him uncomprehendingly. Miss Dinsmead, said Mortimer gently, have you ever had any reason to believe that you are mediumistic? She stared at him. I think you know that you did write SOS last night, he said quietly. Oh, quite unconsciously, of course. A crime stains the atmosphere, so to speak. A sensitive mind such as yours might be acted upon in such a manner. You have been reproducing the sensations and impressions of the victim. Many years ago, she may have written S.O.S. on that table, and you unconsciously reproduced her act last night. Charlotte's face brightened. I see, she said. You think that is the explanation? A voice called her from the house, and she went in, leaving Mortimer to pace up and down the garden path. Was he satisfied with his own explanation? Did it cover the facts as he knew them? Did it account for the tension he had felt on entering the house last night? Perhaps. 
and yet he still had the odd feeling that his sudden appearance had produced something very like consternation. He thought to himself, I must not be carried away by the psychic explanation. It might account for Charlotte, but not for the others. My coming has upset them horribly, all except Johnny. Whatever it is that's the matter, Johnny is out of it. He was quite sure of that. Strange that he should be so positive, but there it was. At that minute, Johnny himself came out of the cottage and approached the guest. Breakfast's ready, he said awkwardly. Will you come in? Mortimer noticed that the lad's fingers were much stained. Johnny felt his glance and laughed ruefully. Oh, I, I, I'm always messing about with chemicals, you know, he said. Makes Dad awfully wild sometimes. He wants me to go into building, but I want to do chemistry and research work. <laughs> Mr. Dinsmead appeared at the window ahead of them, broad, jovial, smiling, and at sight of him all Mortimer's distrust and antagonism reawakened. Mrs. Dinsmead was already seated at the table. She wished him good morning in her colorless voice, and he had again the impression that for some reason or other... She was afraid of him. Magdalen came in last. She gave him a brief nod and took her seat opposite him. Did you sleep well? She asked abruptly. Was your bed comfortable? She looked at him very earnestly, and when he replied courteously in the affirmative, he noticed something very like a flicker of disappointment pass over her face. What had she expected him to say, he wondered. He turned to his host. This lad of yours is interested in chemistry, it seems, he said pleasantly. There was a crash. Mrs. Dinsmead had dropped her teacup. No then, Muggy, no then, said her husband. It seemed to Mortimer that there was admonition, warning in his voice. He turned to his guest and spoke fluently of the advantages of the building trade and of not letting young boys get above themselves. After breakfast, he went out in the garden by himself and smoked. Time was clearly at hand when he must leave the cottage. A night's shelter was one thing. To prolong it was difficult without an excuse. And what possible excuse could he offer? And yet, he was singularly loath to depart. Turning the thing over and over in his mind, he took a path that led round the other side of the house. His shoes were soled with crepe rubber and made little or no noise. He was passing the kitchen window when he heard Dinsmead's words from within, and the words attracted his attention immediately. It's a fair lump of money, it is. Mrs. Dinsmead's voice answered. It was too faint in tone for Mortimer to hear the words. But Dinsmead replied, No, you're on sixty thousand pounds, the lawyer said. Mortimer had no intention of eavesdropping, but he retraced his steps very thoughtfully. The mention of money seemed to crystallize the situation. Somewhere or other there was a question of sixty thousand pounds. It made the thing clearer and uglier. Magdalene came out of the house, but her father's voice called her almost immediately, and she went in again. Presently, Dinsmead himself joined his guest. "'Rare good morning,' he said genially. I hope your car will be none the worse. Wants to find out when I'm going, thought Mortimer to himself. Aloud, he thanked Mr. Dinsmead once more for his timely hospitality. Not at all, not at all, said the other. Magdalene and Charlotte came together out of the house and strolled arm in arm to a rustic seat some little distance away. The dark head and the golden one made a pleasant contrast together, and on an impulse, Mortimer said, your daughters are very unlike, Mr. Dinsmead. The other, who was just lighting his pipe, gave a sharp jerk of the wrist and dropped the match. Do you think so? he asked. Yes, well, uh, I suppose they are. Mortimer had a flash of intuition. But of course, they are not both your daughters, he said smoothly. He saw Dinsmead look at him, hesitate for a moment, and then make up his mind. That's very clever of you, sir, he said. No, one of them is a foundling. We took her in as a baby, and we've brought her up as our own. She herself has not the least idea of the truth, but you'll have to know soon. 
side. A question of inheritance, suggested Mortimer quietly. The other flashed a suspicious look at him. Then he seemed to decide that frankness was best. His manner became almost aggressively frank and open. It's odd that you should say that, sir. A case of telepathy, eh? said Mortimer, and smiled. It's like this, sir. We took her in to oblige the mother for a consideration, as at the time I was just starting in the building trade. A few months ago, I noticed an advertisement in the papers, and it seemed to me that the child in question must be our Magdalene. I went to see the lawyers, and there's been a lot of talk one way and another. They were suspicious. Naturally, as you might say, but everything's cleared up now. I'm taking the girl herself to London next week. She doesn't know anything about it so far. Her father, it seems, was one of those rich Jewish gentlemen. He only learned of the child's existence a few months before his death. He set agents on to try and trace her and left all his money to her when she should be found. Mortimer listened with close attention. He had no reason to doubt Mr. Dinsmead's story. It explained Magdalene's dark beauty, explained, too, perhaps, her aloof manner. Nevertheless, though the story itself might be true... Something lay behind it, undivulged. But Mortimer had no intention of rousing the other's suspicions. Instead, he must go out of his way to allay them. A very interesting story, Mr. Dinsmead, he said. I congratulate Miss Magdalene, an heiress and a beauty. She has a great time ahead of her. She has that, agreed her father warmly. And she's a rare good girl, too, Mr. Cleveland. There was every evidence of hearty warmth in his manner. Well, said Mortimer, I must be pushing along now, I suppose. I've got to thank you once more, Mr. Dinsmead, for your singularly well-timed hospitality. Accompanied by his host, he went into the house to bid farewell to Mrs. Dinsmead. She was standing by the window with her back to them and didn't hear them enter. At her husband's jovial, Here's Mr. Cleveland, come to say goodbye. She started nervously and swung round, dropping something which she held in her hand. Mortimer picked it up for her. It was a miniature of Charlotte, done in the style of some twenty-five years ago. Mortimer repeated to her the thanks he had already proffered to her husband. He noticed again her look of fear and the furtive glances that she shot at him from beneath her eyelids. The two girls were not in evidence, but it was not part of Mortimer's policy to seem anxious to see them. Also, he had his own idea, which was shortly to prove correct. He'd gone about half a mile from the house on his way down to where he'd left the car the night before, when the bushes on the side of the path were thrust aside, and Magdalene came out on the track ahead of him. "'I had to see you,' she said. "'I expected you,' said Mortimer. "'It was you who wrote S.O.S. on the table in my room last night, wasn't it?' Magdalene nodded. "'Why?' asked Mortimer gently. The girl turned aside and began pulling off leaves from a bush. "'We don't know,' she said. "'Honestly, I don't know.' "'Tell me,' said Mortimer. Magdalene drew a deep breath. "'I'm a practical person,' she said. "'Not the kind of person who imagines things or fancies them. "'You, I know, believe in ghosts and spirits. "'I don't.' When I tell you that there is something very wrong in that house, she pointed up the hill, I mean that there is something tangibly wrong. It's not just an echo of the past. It's been coming on ever since we've been there. Every day it grows worse. Father is different. Mother is different. Charlotte is different. Mortimer interposed. Is Johnny different, he asked. Magdalene looked at him, a dawning appreciation in her eyes. No. Oh said. Now I come to think of it, Johnny is not different. He's the only one who's, who's untouched by it all. He was untouched last night at tea. And you? asked Mortimer. I was afraid. Horribly afraid, just like a child. Without knowing what it was I was afraid of. And father was queer. There's no other word for it. Queer. He talked about miracles. Then I prayed, actually prayed for a miracle and you knocked on the door. She stopped abruptly, staring at him. I seem mad to you, I suppose, 
he said defiantly. No, said Mortimer. On the contrary, you seem extremely sane. All sane people have a premonition of danger if it is near them. You don't understand, Magdalene. I was not afraid for myself. For whom, then? But again Magdalene shook her head in a puzzled fashion. I don't know. She went on. I wrote S.O.S. on an impulse. I had an idea, absurd, no doubt, that they would not let me speak to you, the rest of them, I mean. I don't know what it was I meant to ask you to do. I don't know now. No mind, said Mortimer. I shall do it. What can you do? Mortimer smiled a little. I can think. She looked at him doubtfully. Yes, said Mortimer. A lot can be done that way, more than you would ever believe. Tell me, was there any chance word or phrase that attracted your attention just before the meal last evening? Magdalene frowned. I don't think so, she said. At least I heard Father say something to Mother about Charlotte being the living image of her. And he laughed in a very queer way, but there's nothing odd in that, is there? No, said Mortimer slowly. "'except that Charlotte is not like your mother.' "'He remained lost in thought for a minute or two, "'then looked up to find Magdalene watching him uncertainly. "'Go home, child,' he said, "'and don't worry. Leave it in my hands.' "'She went obediently up the path towards the cottage. "'Mortimer strolled on a little further, "'then threw himself down on the green turf. "'He closed his eyes, detached himself from conscious thought or effort, and let a series of pictures flit at will across his mind. Johnny. He always came back to Johnny. Johnny, completely innocent, utterly free from all the network of suspicion and intrigue, but nevertheless the pivot round which everything turned. He remembered the crash of Mrs. Dinsmead's cup on her saucer at breakfast that morning. What had caused her agitation? A chance reference on his part to the lad's fondness for chemicals? At the moment, he had not been conscious of Mr. Dinsmead, but he saw him now clearly as he sat, his teacup poised halfway to his lips. That took him back to Charlotte, as he had seen her when the door opened last night. She had sat staring at him over the rim of her teacup, and swiftly on that followed another memory. Mr. Dinsmead emptying teacups one after the other and saying, this tea is cold. He remembered the steam that went up. Surely the tea had not been so very cold after all. Something began to stir in his brain. A memory of something read not so very long ago, within a month perhaps, some account of a whole family poisoned by a lad's carelessness. A packet of arsenic left in the larder had all dripped through onto the bread below. He had read it in the paper. Probably Mr. Dinsmead had read it too. Things began to grow clearer. It was evening once more in the cottage. The eggs were poached tonight, and there was a tin of brawn. Presently Mrs. Dinsmead came in from the kitchen bearing the big teapot. The family took their places round the table. A contrast to last night's weather said Mrs. Dinsmead, glancing towards the window. Yes, said Mr. Dinsmead. It's so still tonight that you could hear a pen drop. Now then, Mother, pour out, will you? Mrs. Dinsmead filled the cups and handed them round the table. Then, as she put the teapot down, she gave a sudden little cry and pressed her hand to her heart. Mr. Dinsmead swung round his chair, following the direction of her terrified eyes. Mortimer Cleveland was standing in the doorway. He came forward. His manner was pleasant and apologetic. I'm afraid I startled you, he said. I had to come back for something. Back for something? cried Mr. Dinsmead. His face was purple, his veins swelling. Back for what I should like to know? Some tea, said Mortimer. With a swift gesture, he took something from his pocket and taking up one of the teacups from the table, emptied some of its contents into a little test tube he held in his left hand. 
Oh, wow. Oh, what, are, what are you doing? Gasped Mr. Dinsmead. His face had gone chalky white, the purple dying out as if by magic. Mrs. Dinsmead gave a thin, high, frightened cry. You read the papers, I think, Mr. Dinsmead. I'm sure you do. Sometimes one reads accounts of a whole family being poisoned. Some of them recover, some do not. In this case, one would not. The first explanation would be the tinned brawn you were eating, but supposing the doctor to be a suspicious man, not easily taken in by the tinned food theory. There is a packet of arsenic in your larder. On the shelf below is a packet of tea. There is a convenient hole in the top shelf. What more natural to suppose, then, that the arsenic found its way into the tea by accident? Your son, Johnny, might be blamed for carelessness. Nothing more. I... I... I, I don't know what you mean, gasped Dinsmead. I think you do. Mortimer took up a second teacup and filled a second test tube. He fixed a red label to one and a blue label to the other. The red labeled one, he said, contains tea from your daughter Charlotte's cup, the other from your daughter Magdalene's. I am prepared to swear that in the first I shall find four or five times the amount of arsenic than in the latter. You're mad, said Dinsmead. Oh, dear me, no, I am nothing of the kind. You told me today, Mr. Dinsmead, that Magdalene is your daughter. Charlotte was the child you adopted, the child who was so like her mother that when I held a miniature of that mother in my hand today, I mistook it for one of Charlotte herself. Your own daughter was to inherit the fortune, and since it might be impossible to keep your supposed daughter... Charlotte out of sight, and someone who knew the mother might have realized the truth of the resemblance you decided on, well, a pinch of white arsenic at the bottom of a teacup. Mrs. Dinsmead gave a sudden high cackle, rocking herself to and fro in violent hysterics. Tea! She squeaked. That's what he said. <laughs> Tea! Not lemonade! Hold your tongue, can't you? roared her husband wrathfully. Mortimer saw Charlotte looking at him, wide-eyed, wondering, across the table. Then he felt a hand on his arm, and Magdalene dragged him out of earshot. Those, she pointed at the files. Daddy, you won't... Mortimer laid his hand on her shoulder. My child, he said, you don't believe in the past. I do. I believe in the atmosphere of this house. If he had not come to it, perhaps, I say, perhaps, your father might not have conceived the plan he did. I keep these two test tubes to safeguard Charlotte now and in the future. Apart from that, I shall do nothing. In gratitude, if you will, to that hand that wrote S.O.S. The Fourth Man Canon Parfit panted a little. Running for trains was not much of a business for a man of his age. For one thing, his figure was not what it was, and with the loss of his slender silhouette went an increasing tendency to be short of breath. This tendency the canon himself always referred to with dignity as my heart. He sank into the corner of the first-class carriage with a sigh of relief. The warmth of the heated carriage was most agreeable to him. Outside, the snow was falling. Lucky to get a corner seat on a long night journey. Miserable business if you didn't. There ought to be a sleeper on this train. The other three corners were already occupied, and noting this fact, Canon Parfit became aware that the man in the far corner was smiling at him in gentle recognition. He was a clean-shaven man with a quizzical face and hair just turning grey on the temples. His profession was so clearly the law that no one could have mistaken him for anything else for a moment. Sir George Durand was indeed a very famous lawyer. Well, Parfit, he remarked genially, 
You had a run for it, didn't you? Very bad for my heart, I'm afraid, said the Canon. Quite a coincidence, meeting you, Sir George. Are you going far north? Newcastle, said Sir George, laconically. By the way, he said, do you know Dr. Campbell Clark? The man sitting on the same side of the carriage as the Canon inclined his head pleasantly. We met on the platform, continued the lawyer. Another coincidence. Canon Parfit looked at Dr. Campbell Clark with a good deal of interest. It was a name of which he had often heard. Dr. Clark was in the forefront as a physician and mental specialist, and his last book, A Problem of the Unconscious Mind, had been the most discussed book of the year. Canon Parfit saw a square jaw, very steady blue eyes, and reddish hair untouched by grey, but thinning rapidly, and he received also the impression of a very forceful personality. By a perfectly natural association of ideas, the canon looked across to the seat opposite him, half expecting to receive a glance of recognition there also, but the fourth occupant of the carriage proved to be a total stranger, a foreigner, the canon fancied. He was a slight, dark man, rather insignificant in appearance. Huddled in a big overcoat, he appeared to be fast asleep. Canon Parfit of Bradchester, inquired Dr. Campbell Clark in a pleasant voice. The canon looked flattered. Those scientific sermons of his had really made a great hit, especially since the press had taken them up. Well, that was what the church needed. Good, modern, up-to-date stuff. I have read your book with great interest, Dr. Campbell Clark, he said, though it's a bit tactical here and there for me to follow. Duran broke in. Are you for talking or sleeping, Canon? he asked. I confess at once that I suffer from insomnia, and that therefore I am in favour of the former. Oh, certainly, by all means, said the canon. I seldom sleep on these night journeys, and the book I have with me is a very dull one. We are, at any rate, a representative gathering, remarked the doctor with a smile. A church, a law, the medical profession. Not much we couldn't give an opinion on between us, eh? laughed Durand. The church for the spiritual view, myself for the purely worldly and legal view, and you, doctor, with widest field of all, ranging from the purely pathological to the super-psychological. Between us three, we should cover any ground pretty completely, I fancy. Not so completely as you imagine, I think, said Dr. Clark. There's another point of view, you know, that you left out. That's rather an important one. Meaning? queried the lawyer. The point of view of the man in the street. Is that so important? Isn't the man in the street usually wrong? Oh, almost always. But he has the thing that all expert opinion must lack, the personal point of view. In the end, you know, you can't get away from personal relationships. I found that in my profession. For every patient who comes to me genuinely ill, at least five come who have nothing whatever the matter with them except an inability to live happily with the inmates of the same house. They call it everything from housemaid's knee to writer's cramp, but it's all the same thing. The raw surface produced by mind rubbing against mind. You have a lot of patience with nerves, I suppose, the canon remarked disparagingly. His own nerves were excellent. Ah, and what do you mean by that? The other swung round on him quick as a flash. Nerves. People use that word and laugh after it just as you did. Nothing the matter with so-and-so, they say. Just nerves. But good God, man, you've got the crux of everything there. You can get at a mere bodily ailment and heal it. But at this day... We know very little more about the obscure causes of the hundred and one forms of nervous disease than we did in, well, the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Dear me, said Canon Parfit, a little bewildered by this onslaught. Is that so? Mind you, it's a sign of grace, Dr. Campbell Clark went on. In the old days we considered man a simple animal, body and soul with stress laid on the former. Body, soul, 
and spirit, corrected the clergyman mildly. End of side five. End of side five. End of side five. End of side five. Side six. Spirit, the doctor smiled oddly. What do you parsons mean exactly by spirit? You've never been very clear about it, you know. All down the ages you've funked an exact definition. The canon cleared his throat in preparation for speech, but to his chagrin he was given no opportunity. The doctor went on. Are we even sure the word is spirit? Might it not be spirits? Spirits? Sir George Durand questioned, his eyebrows raised quizzically. Yes. Campbell Clark's gaze transferred itself to him. He leaned forward and tapped the other man lightly on the breast. Are you so sure, he said gravely, that there is only one occupant of this structure, for well, that is all it is, you know, this desirable residence to be let furnished for seven, twenty-one, forty-one, seventy-one, whatever it may be, years? And in the end, the tenant moves his things out little by little and then goes out of the house altogether and down comes the house, a mass of ruin and decay. You're the master of the house, we'll admit that, but aren't you ever conscious of the presence of others, soft-footed servants hardly noticed except for the work they do, work that you are not conscious of having done? Or friends, moods? that take hold of you and make you, for the time being, a different man, as the saying goes. You're the king of the castle, right enough, but be very sure the dirty rascal is there, too. My dear Clark, drawled the lawyer, you make me positively uncomfortable. Is my mind really a battleground of conflicting personalities? Is that science's latest? It was the doctor's turn to shrug his shoulders. Your body is, he said dryly. If the body, why not the mind? Very interesting, said Canon Parfit. Ah, wonderful science, wonderful science. And inwardly he thought to himself, I can get a most interesting sermon out of that idea. But Dr. Campbell Clark had leant back in his seat his momentary excitement spent. As a matter of fact, he remarked in a dry professional manner, it is a case of dual personality that takes me to Newcastle tonight. Very interesting case. Neurotic subject, of course, but quite genuine. Dual personality, said Sir George Durand thoughtfully. It's not so very rare, I believe. There's loss of memory as well, isn't there? I know the matter cropped up in a case in the probate court the other day. Dr. Clark nodded. The classic case, of course, he said, was that of Felicie Beau. You may remember hearing of it. Of course, said Canon Parfit. I remember reading about it in the papers quite a long time ago. Seven years, at least. Dr. Campbell Clark nodded. That girl became one of the most famous figures in France. Scientists from all over the world came to see her. She had no less than four distinct personalities. They were known as Felicie I, Felicie II, Felicie III, etc. Wasn't there some suggestion of deliberate trickery? asked Sir George alertly. The personalities of Felicie III and Felicie IV were a little open to doubt, admitted the doctor, but the main facts remain. Felicie Beau was a Brittany peasant girl. She was the third of a family of five, the daughter of a drunken father and a mentally defective mother. In one of his drinking bouts, the father strangled the mother and was, if I remember rightly, transported for life. Felicie was then five years of age. Some charitable people interested themselves in the children and Felicie was brought up and educated by an English maiden lady who had a kind of home for destitute children. She could make very little of Felicie, however. She describes the girl as abnormally slow and stupid, 
only taught to read and write with the greatest difficulty and clumsy with her hands. This lady, Miss Slater, tried to fit the girl for domestic service and did indeed find her several places when she was of an age to take them, but she never stayed long anywhere, owing to her stupidity and also her intense laziness. The doctor paused for a minute, and the canon, recrossing his legs and arranging his travelling rug more closely round him, was suddenly aware that the man opposite him had moved very slightly. His eyes, which had formerly been shut, were now open, and something in them, something mocking and indefinable, startled the worthy canon. It was as though the man was listening and gloating secretly over what he heard. There is a photograph taken of Felicie Beau at the age of seventeen, continued the doctor. It shows her as a loutish, peasant girl, heavy of build. There is nothing in that picture to indicate that she was soon to be one of the most famous persons in France. Five years later, when she was twenty-two, Felicie Beau had a severe nervous illness, and on recovery the strange phenomena began to manifest themselves. The following are facts attested to by many eminent scientists. The personality called Felicie I was undistinguishable from the Felicie Beau of the last twenty-two years. Felicie I wrote French, badly and haltingly. She spoke no foreign languages and was unable to play the piano. Felicie II, on the contrary, spoke Italian fluently and German moderately. Her handwriting was quite dissimilar to that of Felicie I, and she wrote fluent and expressive French. She could discuss politics and art, and she was passionately fond of playing the piano. Felicie III had many points in common with Felicie II. She was intelligent and apparently well-educated, but in moral character she was a total contrast. She appeared, in fact, an utterly depraved creature, but depraved in a Parisian and not a provincial way. She knew all the Paris argot and the expressions of the chic demi-monde. Her language was filthy, and she would rail against religion and so-called good people in the most blasphemous terms. Finally, there was Felicie Faure, a dreamy, almost half-witted creature, distinctly pious and professedly clairvoyant. But this fourth personality was very unsatisfactory and elusive, and has been sometimes thought to be a deliberate trickery on the part of Felicie III, a kind of joke played by her on a credulous public. I may say that, with the possible exception of Felicie IV, each personality was distinct and separate and had no knowledge of the others. Felicie II was undoubtedly the most predominant, and would last sometimes for a fortnight at a time. Then Felicie I would appear abruptly for a day or two. After that, perhaps Felicie III or IV, but the two latter seldom remained in command for more than a few hours. Each change was accompanied by severe headache and heavy sleep, and in each case there was complete loss of memory of the other states, the personality in question taking up life where she had left it, unconscious of the passage of time. Remarkable, murmured the canon. Very remarkable. As yet, we know next to nothing of the marvels of the universe. We know that there are some very astute impostors in it, remarked the lawyer dryly. The case of Felicie Beau was investigated by lawyers as well as by doctors and scientists, said Dr. Campbell Clark quickly. Maitre Cambellier, you remember, made the most thorough investigation and confirmed the views of the scientists. And after all, why should it surprise us so much? We come across the double-yoked egg, do we not? And the twin banana? Why not the double soul in the single body? The double soul, protested the canon. Dr. Campbell Clark turned his piercing blue eyes on him. What else can we call it? That is to say, if the personality is a soul... Oh, it's a good thing such a state of affairs is only in the nature of a freak, remarked Sir George. If the case were common, it would give rise to pretty complications. The condition is, of course, quite abnormal, agreed the doctor. It was a great pity that a longer study could not have been made, but all that was put an end to by Felice's unexpected death. There was something queer about that, if I remember rightly, said the lawyer slowly. Dr. Campbell Clark nodded. A most unaccountable business. 
The girl was found one morning dead in bed. She had clearly been strangled. But to everyone's stupefaction, it was presently proved beyond doubt that she had actually strangled herself. The marks on her neck were those of her own fingers. A method of suicide which, though not physically impossible, must have necessitated terrific muscular strength and almost superhuman willpower. What had driven the girl to such straits has never been found out. Of course, her mental balance must always have been precarious. Still, there it is. The curtain has been rung down forever on the mystery of Elysie Beau. It was then that the man in the far corner laughed. The other three men jumped as though shot. They'd totally forgotten the existence of the fourth amongst them. As they stared towards the place where he sat, still huddled in his overcoat, he laughed again. <laughs> you must excuse me, gentlemen, he said in perfect English that had nevertheless a foreign flavour. He sat up, displaying a pale face with a small jet black moustache. Yes, you must excuse me, he said with a mock bow. But really, in science, is the last word ever said? You know something of the case we have been discussing? asked the doctor courteously. Of the case? No. But I knew her. Felicie Beau? Yes, and Annette Ravel also. You have not heard of Annette Ravel, I see. And yet the story of the one is the story of the other. Believe me, you know nothing of Felicie Beau if you do not also know the history of Annette Ravel. He drew out his watch and looked at it. Just half an hour before the next stop. I have time to tell you the story. That is, if you care to hear it. Please tell it to us, said the doctor quietly. Delighted, said the Callum. Delighted. Sir George Durand merely composed himself in an attitude of keen attention. My name, gentlemen, began their strange travelling companion, is Raoul Lutardot. You have spoken just now of an English lady, Miss Slater, who interested herself in works of charity. I was born in that Brittany fishing village, and when my parents were both killed in a railway accident, it was Miss Slater who came to the rescue and saved me from the equivalent of your English workhouse. There were some twenty children under her care, girls and boys. Amongst these children were Felicie Beau and Annette Ravel. If I cannot make you understand the personality of Annette, gentlemen, you will understand nothing. She was the child of what you call a fille de joie, who had died of consumption, abandoned by her lover. The mother had been a dancer, and Annette, too, had the desire to dance. When I saw her first, she was eleven years old, a little shrimp of a thing with eyes that alternately mocked and promised, a little creature all fire and life. And at once, yes, at once, she made me her slave. It was Raoul, do this for me. Raoul, do that for me. And me, I obeyed. Already I worshipped her, and she knew it. We would go down to the shore together, we three, for Felicie would come with us. And there Annette would pull off her shoes and stockings and dance on the sand. And then when she sank down breathless, she would tell us of what she meant to do and to be. See you... I shall be famous. Yes, exceedingly famous. I will have hundreds and thousands of silk stockings, the finest silk, and I shall live in an exquisite apartment. All my lovers shall be young and handsome, as well as being rich, and when I dance, all Paris shall come to see me. They will yell and call and shout and go mad over my dancing, and in the winters I shall not dance. I shall go south to the sunlight. There are villas there with orange trees. I shall have one of them. I shall lie in the sun on silk cushions eating oranges. As for you, Raoul, I will never forget you, however rich and famous I shall be. I will protect you and advance your career. Felicie here shall be my maid. No, no, no. Her hands are too clumsy. Look at them, how large and coarse they are. Felicie would grow angry at that, and then Annette would go on teasing her. She is so ladylike, Felicie, so elegant and so refined. She's a princess in disguise. <laughs> My mother and father were married, which is more than yours were. Felicie would growl out spitefully. Yes, and your father killed your mother. A pretty thing to be a murderer's daughter. 
Your father left your mother to rot. Felici would rejoin, Ah, yes. Annette became thoughtful. Oh, Ramano, one must keep strong and well. It is everything to keep strong and well. I am as strong as a horse, Felici boasted. And indeed she was. She had twice the strength of any other girl in the home, and she was never ill. But she was stupid, you comprehend. Stupid, like a brute beast. I often wondered why she followed Annette round as she did. It was with her a kind of fascination. Sometimes I think she actually hated Annette, and indeed Annette was not kind to her. She jeered at her slowness and stupidity, and baited her in front of the others. I have seen Felicie go quite white with rage. Sometimes I have thought that she would fasten her fingers round Annette's neck and choke the life out of her. She was not nimble-witted enough to reply to Annette's taunts, but she did learn in time to make one retort which never failed. That was a reference to her own health and strength. She had learned what I had always known, that Annette envied her her strong physique, and she struck instinctively at the weak spot in her enemy's armor. One day, Annette came to me in great glee. Raoul, she said, we shall have fun today with that stupid Felicie. We shall die of laughing. What are you going to do? Come behind the little shade and I will tell you. It seemed that Annette had got hold of some book. Part of it she did not understand, and indeed the whole thing was much over her head. It was an early work on hypnotism. A bright object, they say. The brass knob of my bed, it twirls round. I made Felicie look at it last night. Look at it steadily, I said. Do not take your eyes off it. And then I twirled it, Raoul. I was frightened. Her eyes looked so queer, so queer. Felicie, you will do what I say always, I said. I will do what you say always, Annette, she answered. And then, and then, I said, Tomorrow? You will bring a tallow candle out into the playground at twelve o'clock and start to eat it. And if anyone asks you, you will say that it is the best galette you ever tasted. Oh, Raoul, think of it. But she'll never do such a thing, I objected. Book says so. Not that I can quite believe it, but oh, Raoul, if the book is all true, how we shall amuse ourselves. I, too, thought the idea very funny. We passed word around to the comrades, and at twelve o'clock we were all in the playground. Punctual to the minute, out came Felicie with a stump of candle in her hand. Will you believe me, monsieur? She began solemnly to nibble at it. We were all in hysterics. Every now and then one or other of the children would go up to her and say solemnly, It is good what you eat there, eh, Felicie? And she would answer, But yes, it is the best galette I ever tasted. And then we would shriek with laughter. We laughed at last so loud that the noise seemed to wake up, Felicie, to a realization of what she was doing. She blinked her eyes in a puzzled way, looked at the candle, then at us. She passed her hand over her forehead. But what is it that I do here? She muttered. You are eating a candle, we screamed. I made you do it. I made you do it cried Annette, dancing about. Felicie stared for a moment. Then she went slowly up to Annette. So it is you, it is you who have made me ridiculous. I seem to remember. I will kill you for this. She spoke in a very quiet tone, but Annette rushed suddenly away and hid behind me. Save me, Raoul! I'm afraid of Felicie. It was only a joke, Felicie. Oh, only a joke. I do not like these jokes, said Felicie. You understand? I hate you. I hate you all. She suddenly burst out crying and rushed away. Annette was, I think, scared by the result of her experiment and did not try to repeat it. But from that day on... Her uh, ascendancy over Felicie seemed to grow stronger. Felicie, I now believe, always hated her, but nevertheless she could not keep away from her. She used to follow Annette around like a dog. Soon after that, monsieur, 
Employment was found for me, and I only came to the home for occasional holidays. Annette's desire to become a dancer was not taken seriously, but she developed a very pretty singing voice as she grew older, and Miss Slater consented to her being trained as a singer. She was not lazy, Annette. She worked feverishly, without rest. Miss Slater was obliged to prevent her doing too much. She spoke to me once about her. You've always been fond of Annette, she said. Persuade her not to work too hard. She has a little cough lately that I do not like. My work took me far afield soon afterwards. I received one or two letters from Annette at first, but then came silence. For five years after that, I was abroad. Quite by chance, when I returned to Paris, my attention was caught by a poster advertising Annette Ravelli, the picture of the lady. I recognized her at once. That night, I went to the theater in question. Annette sang in French and Italian. On the stage, she was wonderful. Afterwards, I went to her dressing room. She received me at once. Why, Raoul? She cried, stretching out her whitened hands to me. This is splendid. Where have you been all these years? I would have told her, but she did not really want to listen. You see, I have very nearly arrived. She waved a triumphant hand round the room filled with bouquet. The good Miss Slater must be proud of your success. That old one? No, indeed. She designed me, you know, for the conservatoire. Decorous concert singing. But me, I am an artist. It is here on the variety stage that I can express myself. Just then... A handsome middle-aged man came in. He was very distinguished. By his manner, I soon saw that he was Annette's protector. He looked sideways at me, and Annette explained, A friend of my infancy. He passes through Paris, sees my picture on a poster, and voila! The man was then very affable and courteous. In my presence, he produced a ruby and diamond bracelet and clasped it on Annette's wrist. As I rose to go, she threw me a glance of triumph, and a whisper, I arrive, do I not? You see, all the world is before me. But as I left the room, I heard her cough, a sharp, dry cough. I knew what it meant, that cough. It was the legacy of her consumptive mother. I saw her next, two years later. She had gone for refuge to Miss Slater. Her career had broken down. She was in a state of advanced consumption for which the doctors said nothing could be done. Ah, I shall never forget her as I saw her then. She was lying in a kind of shelter in the garden. She was kept outdoors, night and day. Her cheeks were hollow and flushed, her eyes bright and feverish, and she coughed repeatedly. She greeted me with a kind of desperation that startled me. <laughs> it's, it's good. It's good to see you, Raoul. <laughs> you know what they say, that I may not get well? They say it behind my back, you understand. To me, they are soothing and consolatory, but it is not true, Raoul. <laughs> it, 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 it is not true. I shall not permit myself to die. Die with <coughs> a beautiful life stretching in front of me. It is the will to live that matters. All the great doctors say that nowadays. I am, I am not one of the feeble ones who let go. Already I feel myself infinitely better. Infinitely better. Do you... <coughs> Do you hear? <coughs> she raised herself on her elbow to drive her words home, then fell back attacked by a fit of coughing that racked her thin body. The, the, the cough! The cough! The cough! It is nothing, she gasped. And hemorrhages do not frighten me. I shall surprise the doctors. It is the will that counts. Remember, Raoul, I am going to live. <laughs> it was pitiful, you understand. Pitiful. Just then... Felicie Beau came out with a tray, a glass of hot milk, 
She gave it to Annette and watched her drink it with an expression that I could not fathom. There was a kind of smug satisfaction in it. Annette, too, caught the look. She flung the glass down angrily so that it smashed to bits. You see her! That is how she always looks at me. She is glad I'm going to die. <laughs> yes, she gloats over it. She who is well and strong. <laughs> Look at her. Never a day's illness, that one. And all for nothing. <laughs> what good is that great carcass of hers to her? What can she make of it? Felici stooped and picked up the broken fragments of glass. I do not mind what she says, she observed in a sing-song voice. What does it matter? I am a respectable girl, I am. As for her, she will be knowing the fires of purgatory before very long. I am a Christian. I say nothing. You hate me, cried Annette. You have always hated me. Ah, <laughs> but I can charm you all the same. I can make you do what I want. See, now, <laughs> if, if I ask you to, you would go down on your knees before me. <laughs> now on the grass. You are absurd, said Felice uneasily. But, but yes, you will do it. You will, to please me. Down on your knees, I ask it of you, I, Annette. Down on your knees, Felicity. <laughs> Whether it was the wonderful pleading in the voice or some deeper motive, Felicity obeyed. She sank slowly to her knees, her arms spread wide, her face vacant and stupid. Annette flung her head back and laughed. Peel upon peal of laughter. <laughs> Look at her! <laughs> With her stupid face! How ridiculous she looks! <laughs> you can get up now, Felice. Thank you. It is of no use to scowl at me. I, I, I am your mistress. You, you have to do what I say. <sighs> She lay back on her pillows, exhausted. Felici picked up the tray and moved slowly away. Once she looked back over her shoulder, and the smoldering resentment in her eyes startled me. I was not there when Annette died, but it was terrible, it seems. She clung to life. She fought against death like a mad woman. Again and again she gasped out, I will not die, do you hear me? I will not die. I will live, live. Miss Slater told me all this when I came to see her six months later. My poor Raoul, she said kindly. You loved her, did you not? Always. Always. But of what use could I be to her? Let us not talk of it. She is dead. She is so brilliant, so full of burning life. Miss Slater was a sympathetic woman. She went on to talk of other things. She was very worried about Felicie, so she told me. The girl had had a queer sort of nervous breakdown, and ever since she had been very strange in manner. You know, said Miss Slater after a momentary hesitation, that she is learning the piano. I did not know it and was very much surprised to hear it. Felicie, learning the piano... I would have declared the girl would not know one note from another. She has talent, they say, continued Miss Slater. I can't understand it. I've always put her down as, well, Raoul, you know yourself, she was always a stupid girl. I nodded. She is so strange in her manner sometimes. I really don't know what to make of it. A few minutes later, I entered the salle de lecture. Felicie was playing the piano. She was playing the air that I had heard Annette sing in Paris. You understand, monsieur, it gave me quite a turn. And then hearing me, she broke off suddenly and looked round at me, her eyes full of mockery and intelligence. For a moment, I thought, well, 
I, I will not tell you what I thought. Tiens, she said. So it is you, Monsieur Raoul. I cannot describe the way she said it. To Annette, I had never ceased to be Raoul. But Felicie, since we had met as grown-ups, always addressed me as Monsieur Raoul. But the way she said it now was different, as though the Monsieur, slightly stressed, or somehow very amusing. Why, uh, uh, Felicie, I stammered, you look quite different today. Do I? She said reflectively, it's odd, that. But do not be so solemn. Raoul, decidedly, I shall call you Raoul. Did we not play together as children? Life was made for laughter. Let us talk of the poor Annette, she who is dead and buried. Is she in the purgatory, I wonder, or where? And she hummed a snatch of song, untunefully enough, but the words caught my attention. Felicie, I cried, you speak Italian? Why not, Raoul? I'm not as stupid as I pretend to be, perhaps. She laughed at my mystification. I don't understand, I began, but I will tell you. I am a very fine actress, though no one suspects it. I can play many parts, and play them very well. She laughed again and ran quickly out of the room before I could stop her. I saw her again before I left. She was asleep in an armchair. She was snoring heavily. I stood and watched her, fascinated yet repelled. Suddenly she woke with a start. Her eyes, dull and lifeless, met mine. Monsieur Raoul, she muttered mechanically. Yes, Felicie, I'm going now. Will you play to me again before I go? I play? You are laughing at me, Monsieur Raoul. Don't you remember playing to me this morning? She shook her head. I play? How can a poor girl like me play? She paused for a minute, as though in thought, then beckoned me nearer. Monsieur Raoul, there are strange things going on in this house. They play tricks upon you. They alter the clocks. Oh, yes, yes, I know what I'm saying. And it is all her doing. Who's doing? I asked, startled. That Annette, that wicked ones. When she was alive, she always tormented me. Now that she is dead, she comes back from the dead to torment me. He stared at Felicie. I could see now that she was in an extremity of terror, her eyes staring from her head. She is bad, that one. She is bad, I tell you. She would take the bread from your mouth, the clothes from your back, the soul from your body. She clutched me suddenly. I'm afraid, I tell you. Afraid. I hear her voice. Not in my ear. No, 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 not in my ear. Here, in my head. She tapped her forehead. She will drive me away. Drive me away altogether. And then what shall I do? What will become of me? Her voice rose almost to a shriek. She had in her eyes the look of the terrified brute beast at bay. Suddenly she smiled, a peasant smile full of cunning, with something in it that made me shiver. If it should come to it, Monsieur Raoul, I am very strong with my hands, very strong with my hands. I had never noticed her hands particularly before. I looked at them now and shuddered in spite of myself. Squat, brutal fingers, and as Felicie had said, terribly strong. I cannot explain to you the nausea that swept over me. but hands such as these, her father must have strangled her mother. That was the last time. I ever saw Felicie Beau. Immediately afterwards, I went abroad to South America. I returned from there two years after her death. Something I had read in the newspapers of her life 
and sudden death. I have heard fuller details tonight from you, gentlemen. Elysi three and Elysi four. I wonder. She was a good actress, you know. The train suddenly slackened speed. The man in the corner sat erect and buttoned his overcoat more closely. What is your theory? asked the lawyer, leaning forward. I can hardly believe, began Canon Parfit and stopped. The doctor said nothing. He was gazing steadily at Raoul de Pardo. The clothes from your back, the soul from your body, quoted the Frenchman lightly. He stood up. I say to you, monsieur, that the history of Felicie Beau is the history of Annette Ravel. You did not know her, gentlemen. I did. She was very fond of life. His hand on the door, ready to spring out, he turned suddenly and, bending down, tapped Canon Parfit on the chest. Monsieur le docteur over there, he said just now that all this, his hand smote the Canon's stomach and the Canon winced, was only a residence. Tell me, if you find a burglar in your house, what do you do? Shoot him, do you not? No, no, cried the Canon. No, indeed. I mean, not in this country. But he spoke the last words to empty air. The carriage door banged. The clergyman, the lawyer, and the doctor were alone. 